Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Craft Beer Nation's special Saturday Hangout, a worldwide collaborative social IPA, The Big Sip Up. We're joined this morning by Matt and Gill at James River Brewing, Michael Tangan, Felix Estrada, Alan Huerta, Ashley Bauer at Conquest Brewery, and our good friends in the UK, Simon Martin of Real Ale Guide, and Rains Craft Brewing with their brewmaster, Bill Dotson. Today, Bill and Simon are going to kick off the Big Sippa Collaborative Brew, and throughout the day, we'll have breweries from all over coming to join the Hangout through their versions of the Big Sippa and chatting with us about the growing craft beer industry. In addition to the many participating breweries, we'll have some special guests, such as Untapped co-founder Greg Avila, Master Cicerone Nicole Ernie, Michael will be taking home brewing questions later, and we even have a cooking demo planned. We'll be here until 5 p.m. today, and on behalf of Craft Beer Nation and the wonderful Craft Beer Nation mods, welcome to the Big Sippa, and let's get this beer brewing. All right, it's uh, it's 10 a.m. here on the East Coast. Uh, I'm going to get a cold one from the bar. Uh, anybody else going to have one with me? I know it's a little early there for Felix. What's it, 7 o'clock? Okay, that was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> It's apparently too early for internet in California. That's all he sounds to me all the time. <laughs> the internet has not started working there yet. I don't blame it. It just needs a drink. He does. Uh, <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> so, Simon and Bill, how are things going? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, we mashed in about an hour and a half ago. We just started, um, started our run off to the copper. So we're uh, a little bit ahead of you guys in time. And... Uh, in the, in the process as well, so, so far so good. Would you like to see the master? Yes. I'll have the, the webcam here. And we'll just give you a bit of a guided tour. So this is our master here um, on the little craft brewery. We're um, we're just uh, sparging away and we're running through to the copper, so everything's going nicely at the moment. Uh, this is where you need smell and vision as well as video, because the, the smell of the malt is just gorgeous at the moment. Um, if I just take the camera, I'll just give you a bit of a guided tour of the brewery. Um, in terms of, this is this is the main brewery. Our, our small craft brewery is is um, is built within our main brew house. So we've got a large mash tun right next to where we're operating today. Um, this mash tun holds um, seven and a half tons of grain, so we can produce um, something around uh, between 150 and 250 um, UK barrels. Simon's, Simon's uh, stood resplendent in his uh, in his, his new T-shirt. Have you got any questions for us, guys? I wonder how how typical is that recipe for you? Sorry, could you repeat that? Like. How different is that recipe for you? Is that something very unusual from what you normally do? Um, not since we've since we've installed the craft brewery. We've been doing beers very similar to this. Um, the, the beer that we developed with Simon over a year ago um, is an American IPA, so that's um, similar to this. And, and our small craft brewery has enabled us to um, experiment a lot with some of the beers like that. What is the thing you guys brew most at that brewery? Is there a particular style coming out of y'all's craft brewery that is the most popular right now? From our craft brewery, uh, I think we've got two two beers that um, that we developed last year that have been very popular. In fact, we can judge that by the fact that they're now available in bottle across the whole of the UK. One is the beer we brewed with Simon, Barry Island IPA. And another one is um, a beer called Boilermaker. And um, the Boilermaker was is a um, is a whiskey infused IPA, so it's it's aged on oak chips. But we we have a link up with a local uh, whiskey company called Pendering Welsh Whiskey, um, and we actually ferment the wash and they distill it. So we've used some of their whiskey to to um, to soak the oak chips to flavour that beer, and that one's proven equally as popular. Um, so those two are our, our, our most popular craft beers so far, but we're just about to launch two more nationally this year. In fact, we just popped them last, last week. Um, 
So um, we'll see how they go as well. Fantastic. Does anybody else have questions for Bill or Simon? Ashley at Complex, how are you guys doing? We're doing great. It's a beautiful morning here in South Carolina. Um, ever so slightly humid, but not nearly as hot as it could be, so I'm very happy. Awesome. So we have three breweries on air right now, but right now the only one brewing is Brain. We're actually brewing. Um, we're ac they're actually mashing in right here in the. Uh, okay, they're mashing in right now. Yeah, but we we have to do camera work. Uh, we'll do that. They're actually brewed twice today. They brew on a barrel and a half, and they're going to they're brewing brew again at lunch. So we'll see them mashing in the second batch. Uh, awesome. Maybe maybe Simon could tell us a little bit. Inspiration for that beer. How's the, you know, you know, we're drinking beer today. Brains <laughs> of the beer. What was your inspiration for the beer, sir? My my inspiration for the for the beer for Barry Island IPA. Or, or actually, let, let's talk a little bit about the this big sipper because I come in with Bill. Uh, we sat down on the table. We looked at the recipe and. Uh, we wanted to a recipe that could be sourced by everybody in it from around the world. We did originally have somebody from Sweden, but unfortunately they dropped up, so it had to be uh, a kind of a, uni a universal, worldwide kind of selection of uh, hops and malt. Do you think that was quite a difficult thing to do, Bill, or do you think the ingredients these things are all, they're kind of easy to get with everywhere in the world? Um, well, I think the great thing is that you know ingredients from all over the world are, are, are now you know used all over the world. So you know we're not just using our own local ingredients anymore. We're using ingredients from all over, um, and um, to produce different styles of beer. So um, you know most people here in the UK have got access to um, to a right array of, of US as well as Australian, New Zealand um, hops, and, and um, I'm curious whether. You know, much of the British hops are getting over to to, uh, to the U.S. as well. They are. I've seen a few of them. There's a brewery here in particular. It does um, a lot with the Fuggle Fuggle hops. Yeah. They love them. They have like a, a few of their beers are named after it, and they do quite a few beers with it. And I like it a lot. I think it's a great hop that's not used that much here. Yeah, our um, our traditional brains beers use puzzles and goldings as the aroma hop. They have them for, for decades, basically, and we contract puzzles and, and golding hops um, for a number of years in advance to make sure that we get the right quality, the right quality of hops. So, um, our traditional brains beers are very much centered around the puzzle and the golding hop. Um, there's a lot of UK um, ales, to be honest. I find it quite interesting that. You've got um, the Americans enjoying the Fuggle Hop in a bit of a kind of a, a fashionable way, and we're enjoying American hops over here. So it's like a transatlantic swap, if you like, of, of um, popular hops. Well, you always want what you can't get, so the things that are a bit more unusual and a bit different are the things that you know that, that people are interested in. I, I suppose wherever you are. So. Talking of hops, we've um, we've got our just weighed up some of our hops out. So um, so again, if I can um, if I can direct this in here, as you can see, um, that's our hop bill that's going to go into the uh, into the copper later on here. Um, mm. I can smell it from here. Yeah, you can <laughs> smell it. Well, I'll tell you what, it smells better at this end of the wire. So um, <laughs> never tire of the smell of those things. I tell you. So. Um, so uh, what stage are we at now? So what's the, um, we've, we've kind of smashed in, what's, what's next if I just leave this? Yeah, we're, um, we matched in, um, I say, I, I, I started matching in about half past one, um, so we completed the match um, about ten to two local five. Um, so um, we started the run off from the match till into the copper behind me here. Um, at about 10 to 3, so about 10 minutes before we went on air. So, so at the moment we're just running the work through and we're sparging as we uh, showed you on the camera. 
Um, what we'll do in a minute, we're just going to say next time, we've got an underback underneath the, the mash tun that pumps up into the copper, and that pumps up in doses. So the next time it pumps up, we're going to take a sample here in the jug. And um, this is Simon's favourite bit. I know he always likes to taste the word. Yeah. Point, so. Another word, especially yeah. in the winter. But he's on a low carb <laughs> diet at the moment, so Mel, his wife, is not going to watch this. No. I hope she's not watching. I went to camp just to look in the phone shop. <laughs> <laughs> I think we had a few more questions for you guys. Uh, Felix wanted to ask about craft brewing, yes, in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Felix needs to also fix his microphone. <laughs> uh, yes, what is going on? That's a good question. Felix is going to stay muted for a moment. Um, I think what he was going to ask you guys was about craft brewing in the UK and kind of where it is now and where it's going. Um, are there a lot of other UK breweries who are trying to get into the more craftier styles as opposed to the traditional ones? Yeah, definitely. It's moving very, very quickly in the UK at the moment. So um, it is a little bit of a, of a sort of craft beer explosion. Um, and that's really happened, really took a pace in the last sort of 18 months, to be honest. Um, our, our little brewery here is only just over a year old, and, and we took the decision. Probably two years ago was our decision to say, well, we needed something where we could do smaller batches of different stuff, and, and um, we were very conscious of what was happening over in the US and, and the explosion of craft beer there. Um, but we wanted it to also to sort of complement what we could do in our in our main brewery as well. So, um, you know, the beer industry in the UK is, is is very mixed. There are some very really explosive areas of growth, but there are some of the more mature areas of beer industry that are suffering from declining volumes. So it's important if you really want a future in beer that you look at what the trends are and what's, um, what's going to be the next thing, that, that um, the way that, that beer is going. I mean, we as a company are over 130 years old, and well, we haven't survived for that long by ignoring what the different trends from the consumer are. So the consumers really, serve, you know, they are looking for more and more different tastes in their beer, um, and we, as a company, want to deliver those. We want to deliver great beer that people want to drink. And there's a whole debate about what is craft beer and what is the definition. Simon, grab a sample. That's the, the, the work pumping up. So I've got him well trained. But, um, so yeah, there's, there's um, you know, there's been a whole debate about what's craft beer and stuff like that. It's just Great beer is popular, great new beers are popular, and as long as it's good and it's interesting, it's exciting. Awesome. So has the American version of the IPA, that hot beer version, been pretty well received in the UK? Yeah, to be honest, it's, um, you know, but it's just one, it's just one style in terms yeah. of new styles of beer, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of um, other styles of beer from all over the world being brewed. Um, I mean, say, the Belgian saisons for me are a really, really great area of beer. We brewed two recently, um, both quite different, and um, you know the, the the choice within that category of beer is endless. So, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty eclectic mix over here in the UK. You know, because we're so close to Europe, we've got a little lot of influence from Europe, and um, again, you know, like I say, we've got a lot of influence from what's happening over in the in the um, in the US as well. I've got a question um, in terms of where you guys are in um, in America. Over here, there's a big battle between cask and keg. And for me personally, I always prefer my own beer like Google Brain, Barrow and IPA. I prefer it off a keg rather than a, a cask. Keg bigger bigger in America than the cask. Does someone have a baby with them? Yeah. Alan <laughs> was great making some noise there. Um, <laughs> we, uh, uh, personally, I mean, I could go either way on it. I like to try beers off a cask and, and compare them to how the how they get uh, uh, finished and polished in cake. So I don't know. I, I guess if, if I ever go to a, a beer bar and there's a cask of any kind, that, that's what I have them pull for me anyway. But um, I don't know. It, it seems to be a bigger 
a lot more real ale in the UK than there is here in the States. I think it's definitely more of a treat for us. Yeah, when I see it, I get excited because it's not something that is readily practiced here to have real ale about cast that fires, and I think it's fun. I mean, we see more of the firkins and the pins for kind of craft beer events and such, but not so much as an everyday option when we go to drink at a bar. Yeah, we've for me got, at least. Um, we've got a kind of a traditional, so we're talking about um, a mature market earlier. That mature market is mainly cast beer, fresh live cast beer. But uh, a lot of the newer breweries and, and, and now brains, they're starting to put beer in keg. And I find it stays so much kind of, it, it's, it's got the force carbonation, it stays fresher. I, I find it a lot tastier in, in keg, personally. Anybody else have an opinion on this? Cask or keg? No, not at all. What about you, Tara? I'll ask you. What's your opinion on cask and keg? Uh, if I could have casks readily available to drink at my local bars, I would, I mean, it would be, it's more of a novelty for me. It's not something that they already have around. So if I saw that, yeah, I think I'd be more apt to drink it. Uh, I think if I was living somewhere where there was casks readily available in the bars, I'd probably have a more staunch opinion on it. Uh, right now, if I see a cask at a bar, I don't care what it is, I just order it. <laughs> what did you do? You went to that, you went to that cask, that real ale festival, where there were like 30 of them. So what did you do there? Oh, the, the one I had in March, where they had all the different casks? Yeah. That was awesome. There was like 12 casks, and I made sure to go down the road and try all of them real quick before I started, because I was volunteer. It was you, amazing. You went the One Direction walk, and it was like crawling? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for Bill. Uh, Bill, tell us a little bit about your background and where where you learned through. And I mean, did you go to school for it? Did you start mopping the floors? I mean, how did you get into brewing? Um, yeah, I got into brewing by accident actually, which um, which was a nice accident. Um, I uh, I did a degree in chemical engineering at university, um, and uh, quite a few years ago when I left, um, I got offered a job to work in a brewery. Um, it was either a brewery uh, or a chocolate factory, and I chose beer over chocolate, and I think I made the right decision. Huh. Um, and really just fell in love with the industry from almost from day one, to be honest. Um, really felt like it was the place I wanted to be and the industry I wanted to be in for the rest of my life. So um, I actually started working for Carlsberg um, in, the, in Burton on Trent in the UK. Um, and got a fantastic training with them and took all my brewing exams um, and then a series of brewery mergers takeovers saw me work for Bass and um, for Interbrew as they were then for the select for a period of time and then finally for um for cause when they bought the um the part of the old Bass business in the UK so um so I, I worked in the same brewery pretty much but with four different large brewery owners um, and had a really great um, apprenticeship brewing all kinds of beer. When I started in the brewery in Burn, we were still brewing a lot of cask beer. Um, um, we were brewing, uh, when we became part of Bass, we were brewing uh, Draft Bass, an iconic um, beer that, you know, unfortunately is, um, has dwindled away to pretty, pretty much nothing now. Um, and, and then seven and a bit years ago, um, the offer of the job came up here at Brains as head brewer, and um, I took the opportunity and um, have, uh, have been here ever since. So um, it really is close to my heart in terms of being able to produce really great cra uh, cask beers, um, you know, and, and having that responsibility of brewing the beers that have been brewed for, for generations, um, and now this added dimension of of building this plant behind me here, um, of taking it from you know a piece of paper that I started doing a few sketches on to the reality, and then you know a year later we've brewed 40 odd different beers through here, playing around with different stuff. You know, I you know I have to sort of pinch myself and think, well, you know, I'm pretty lucky, really. And I'm just going to jump in here because um, I think technology as well. It's almost like. Um, you've got technology on one side booming away with all of these Google Plus sites and Facebook and Twitter and moving away from old media 
So now the craft plant that we got here, and that, that, that side of the business is booming as well. So we're able to do all of these different, like, what's your take on this whole kind of, we're live all around the world? I think it's fantastic. Um, <laughs> I think it's a bit scary, really. So, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying that I don't mess up here. Sorry, I need my eyes in the back of my head at the moment. This is a very manual plant, our craft brewery. So, um, so temperature control and things are all on the valves here. So when we're starting, I've got to keep an eye on what the temperature is and the, the valve. So please excuse me when I just keep turning around and, uh, and checking things are okay. So uh, we might have all the technology in front of us here, but we've still got what is basic brewing the way it's always been done behind us, which um, I suppose is a bit like that. Do you, do you have a, a person that's full-time job to scrub your equipment? <laughs> to scrub it? Sorry? <laughs> do you have a guy hired a full-time, like, just to scrub your equipment? I think I, so. I wish we had. It's you, it's you that's right. Huh? <laughs> no, no, no. We, um, the main brew house is run by a team of four people. Um, and uh, they're all sat in the garden at home in the sunshine at the moment. So, um, so I'm the only one foolish enough to be in today. But um, they've they've been polishing the stuff behind me because they knew it was coming all over the world. So I'm not <laughs> the time as much as this. Uh, Ashley had a question. Yeah, I was going to ask, how many barrels is your brew house there? I, I didn't know if you already said that, but. The small, the small brew house, the craft brew house, is between 10 and 15 UK barrels, so um, 15 to 25 hectolitres. The main brew house, um, each brew is between 150 and 250 UK barrels, so whatever that is converted to actually up to 400 hectolitres per brew. Um, and we're producing in the main brewery about 400,000 hectolitres a year. And how many brew pubs you guys said you said you guys have? Sorry, could you repeat that? How many brew pubs did you say you guys have? How many pubs? We've got about 250 pubs, um, and they're spread um, from very local to the brewery here in Cardiff. We've got a lot of pubs local, um, but we've got them throughout the, the throughout Wales and a few into over the border into England as well. How many, how many of them will have the big SIPA in, in a month? Do you distribute your craft beers to all those? Do you have a, a few tap handles in each of those? There's about 30 pubs that the craft beer, this beer will go out in cask, and there's about 30 pubs that, um, that take the cask versions of the craft beers that we produce. Awesome. Uh, I'm kind of jealous. I want to try the big SIPA out of the cask. <laughs> <laughs> Get a plane ticket and, uh, and you're ready. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. How many? Uh, how many of your pubs have uh, hotels to them? Also, some I saw some had room and board. Also. Um, yeah, we've got about 10, 10 or twelve of the, the. We've got one that's, that's a that's a hotel, but we've got about ten or twelve of our pubs that um, that have rooms as well. Some of them are in the um, the holiday areas near the beaches and that, and in West Wales. So. Um, so a big part of the, the business is accommodation, and um, we've had some fantastic weather the last few weeks in the UK. I think um, no one can remember how, when it was sunny for this long. Normally we get one or two days and then it rains again, but uh, it's been about three and a half weeks of dry, hot weather, and uh, that's why we're looking a bit hot here. We've not got a brew out for the COVID hot weather. Well, the reason you're so, so hot is we have all the rain on the east coast of the US, so it's been raining a month now. So. Yeah? Oh, uh, well, I hope the rain falls over there and doesn't come back over this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it must be staying over there and we're not getting it as we normally do. Simon, do you have a calendar right now that you're going to be, you know, checking in to the tasting day? I bet you're excited to get that beer out, huh? <laughs> you're here. Oh, they left. And they disappear. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering how excited you are right now, Simon, to have this and expectations for the, the beer to be ready. Oh, that really excited, really excited by this. Um, over the last three years, built up a great working relationship with Brains. It started off with a YouTube, YouTube brewery tour, which me and Bill three years ago, I probably got a little bit more hair back then, <laughs> starting to receive. But um, yeah, we've been a, a real L guy. 
we did a, a brewery tour of four past series, I think three and a half years ago. Is it that long it's, ago? It's that long ago. <laughs> ago. And it's just basically been where it brings um, really to new beer. I'll come along to the event or we'll go to London together. Um, we've got the Millennium Stadium in, in Cardiff. I've been to a couple of big kind of rugby matches with them. And it's just like it's. Bill mentioned to me before um, when we were having a drink that it's like a big kind of family in Brains and it does certainly feel that way. It's, um, it's, it's great stuff, it's great to be involved with them. No, that's awesome. Do we have any more questions right now for Brains Brewing? I got one. I got one. Do you plan on, you said you're about putting this big sipper in cask, do you plan on putting any in cake? Um, we might do actually, but um, we've got some of our keg beers planned for the next few weeks. Um, so the majority of this beer will go into will go into cask, although we'll probably bottle off. Um, we've got a small um, prototype bottling plant, so um, where we just hand bottle some beers. So it's a good way of preserving it for uh, posterity. And uh, you never know, we might be able to then put a few different big sippers from the different breweries together and uh, have a taste there, see how similar or not they taste. But it'd be quite an interesting thing to do, really. Absolutely. You know, I if you bottle one of those and put a label on it and you sign it, I'll pay the shipping. From <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll have, to, uh, we'll have to sort that out, actually. I, we haven't really thought beyond the brew day at the moment, so... Um, Hello. Hello. Hello, Master. Oh, I just muted them since they were. <laughs> we we didn't want to interfere too much with the uh, the brains time here, so. Um. <laughs> yeah, and and their mic is a little loud in case yeah. somebody else noticed. Yeah. But we have about. 15 more minutes of special Brains Craft Brewery time, and we'd love to hear more from you guys. Is there anything you want American craft brewers uh, and craft beer drinkers to know when they come, like where we can find you guys, <laughs> and more specifically, or just in general, about coming to the UK and drinking the beer there? Well, anyone that comes to the UK, we would very much recommend you come to Cardiff. Um, Cardiff is really an up-and-coming city. Um, it's got great, it's, it's quite a small city, but it's got great facilities. Everything's quite compact and in one place. We've got a castle and we've got great beer, obviously. And Cardiff <laughs> is a great place to, to, to come and visit. That's where you live in a castle? Yeah. Sorry? Is that where you live in a castle? <laughs> no, my, my, mine's just a little bit smaller than a castle. It's more of a mansion <laughs> castle, yeah. So um, I think he just yeah. invited anybody in the world that wants to go to Cardiff to stay with him too. So don't get a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> just circle Bill Dobson on Google Plus or Twitter, and you can stay there. Stay in the castle. Of course, we are all all those British live in castles, you see. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. If people do come to the UK, and um, you know, I mean, most people want to visit London and and do. To you know the usual high-profile tourist places, but Cardiff is worth two or three days out of that itinerary. It's only two hours on the train from London, um, and it's, it's just a great place to come and, and visit. Let's say try the beer. It's got a lovely area down by the bay in Cardiff um, where you can just go out, chill out, and relax, and have a beer and a bite to eat and things like that. And it's um, it's a really exciting place to be honest. It's um, it's a great place to live and work. Um, and um, um, yeah, I highly recommend it, especially if there's some sport going on. If Wales are playing rugby, then it's a whole different atmosphere. Um, it just, the place just goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here, I have a question for you. That, uh, here in the US, like, breweries are having such a tough time to get their label approved and stuff like this, taking longer and longer. Uh, is, that, is that the same in, back in UK? How do you guys handle that kind of thing back there? Do you well, we don't seem to. I, I know you guys have very tight labeling regulations and they differ from state to state, as I understand. Um, 
we, we do have regulations in the UK, but they seem to be a little bit more simple. Um, we do have things that we are we have to put on the label or we're recommended to put on the label in terms of units of alcohol and the way we display the ABV and things like that. And there's also regulations about, you know, we can't put cartoons or childish images and things like that on the, on the label. Um, one of the reasons we came up with all of our craft beers um, have the same generic type of label. We changed the colour and we changed the name. Um, and uh, if I will just go nip and get some, actually, we can show you some of those. Um, so we'll show you some of the labelling that we do. And um, what we're going to do now, actually, is um, we've just got some of the work tools. So we're just going to do a gravity on the work. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be in the right gravity. Um, so that perfect, perfect balance. Sorry, I, I've just been talking lifted up for the camera. Um, <laughs> So this is our work that's running off at the moment, and we are just the shade over 1080. So we've got a nice, a nice work, um, concentrated work at the moment. And I know this is Simon's favourite bit. That's why I got him a glass. He uh, <laughs> wants to drink the work, huh? He needs to build his energy up. He had all his hair cut off, and he's got no energy. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm dying to get into this. This is the first taste of the big sipper. And it's like Horlicks. Do you guys get Horlicks out there? It's like a malty, sugary drink. No? Well, this, this is like Horlicks for me. Do, do you like it, Bill? I don't know. You're not giving me a taste yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly how it should be. We've got sweet malt flavors in there. We've got a nice um, nice golden colour. Um, you know, we've got the gravity there. So, so far, so good. Everything's going great. Well, we, we had no doubt you could do it, that's for sure. <laughs> it's true. We had full faith in you. Yeah, well, it's always, if you go and do something like this, you're always grateful that, you know, some of the technology is going to let you down. So when I came in the brewery this morning, I was really glad that the boiler had kicked in because we put it on a timer and things. So, so uh, I was sweating a little bit on that, but um, so far, so good. How long are you waiting until you dry hop? Sorry? How long are you going to wait until you dry hop? So we dry hop. Um, well, what we actually do is we um, we put our, our what you would call your dry hops. We put them in the fermenter at the start of the fermentation. Um, that's a technique we've been using for a long time, and we'll be doing what you call your equivalent of dry hopping. We'll be putting them in the fermenter. Um, so you know, I don't know whether that's a technique that others use or, or not. We we don't tend to because we're using all pallets. So we're not tending to put hops into the um, into the into the maturation tank. Um, but then, if it's a cast beer, we have the technique. Obviously, the original dry hopping technique of cast beers, we put the the, the whole week hop pellets into the actual cask of beer that goes out to the pub. So um, so we do. Some of our beers have dry hop in, um, and. Um, you know that's quite a distinctive, uh, different, um, different style of beer as well. Um, Ashley over at Conquest has a question for you. Okay. Hi, I got the brewery here at Conquest with me today. Matt here, Joseph. They wanted to ask a question. I'm sorry, um, I'm just going to put my ear by the camera. Go ahead, by the... Um, Simon, I was just wondering if I saw you with a pitcher or a bucket drinking from it earlier. Just a, a a drink. <laughs> Were you drinking from a bucket? Oh, was I drinking from a bucket? Oh, um, that, was the, that was the first kind of... I was just messing about with boiling hot work. <laughs> I was just kind of just messing about. But this is the... Uh, this is the first look at the work for the big sipper over from... Wales in the UK. Yeah, um, probably, you know, so yeah. Plastic glasses. you drink from a bucket all the time that we know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> really I, I generally have to drink from a bucket with all the reviews I've seen during the week. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got some of our um, some examples of our beers here. Um, let's just switch the camera back, Simon, so I can. Um, 
Yeah, so, so we talked about some of the, the branding and the labeling that we do in the UK. So, so this, is, uh, this is the beer we brewed with Simon, the Barry Island IPA. So you can Hi. hopefully make out the, um, the Brains Craft Brewery logo. Um, and then there's a little caricature of Simon up in the corner here. Um, and he's actually saying Stone the Crows, which is one of his catchphrases. Um, <laughs> we've got the same design we do on the different beers. So this is a beer called Blackbird, um, that we produced this beer with, um, with a, a lady called Robin Black of, the, uh, of, of one of the uh, trade press over here. Um, this, is our, this is our Atlantic White, so this is our white IPA. Um, inspired by a visit I made over to Denver last year to the Great American Beer Festival where I paid some white IPAs and wanted to do my own version. Um, so that's, um, that's another, um, that's a 5% hybrid uh, wick beer. Um, and this is a, a, a very pink beer that we produced with um, a beer writer over here called Marvreen Cole. Um, this was her collaboration beer with us last year. Um, and this, this next one is a very special one because Theo, who's towering behind the camera at this end, she, um, she brewed this beer with, with me um, and this has been a real good success. This is Bragging Rights, which is our funny infused brag out. And I'm going to turn the camera around on it in a minute. Yeah, it's important because Make us say hello. 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 <laughs> how are you? Female <laughs> in the UK. Oh, yeah, she's one of the more deeper female brewers, right? Hi, So there's Fiona, there's her beer, yeah. So she's hiding behind the camera and she's doing the technology for us today. So um, <laughs> me and Simon just make a tool of ourselves and come a bit normally. Simon, I know that you and Bill are friends, but I'd like you right now to just get as many of those bottles in your pocket as you can, and I will pay for I will pay for it. I'm on my back. Yeah, yeah. I want. 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 So uh, we've been running to, into the copper now for a while, so um, hopefully you should be able to see in there, we've got our wort in the bottom of the copper, it's quite a bit of foam on top at the moment, so uh, that's been running off now, coming into there. Um, sorry, before I fall over the step here, um, so if we look back in the mash tun now, uh, not a lot has changed, I suppose. We've still got um, still got the sparge going on. It's running off quite nicely. Um, we can see the, uh, the level of the wort in the sight glass here. In fact, um, I'm just able to, to speed the runoff up slightly, actually, because um, we're just gaining the, the levels going up in there, so we're just able to, uh, to do that. Um, so we can see the level of the wort in the mash tun in the sight glass there. So we keep an eye on that just to keep the balance right between the sparge that we're putting on and how much we're, we're, we're pumping over into the uh, into the copper. And you just that's just started to go in there. You just see the words pumping up into the copper. Sorry, um, that's with the side glass there. So that's the word coming off from the underback and up into the copper. It'll stop again in a second. <laughs> that that's a uh, that's really that's really great. I, I'm, this is fun. Yep. Let me get to see that. That is really cool. Ah. You want to give another walk through your your area so we can see your brewery again? He just did. Oh, oh. Gil, Gil was over moving something around. He, he just missed it. Yeah. yeah. If I just pan back now, you can just see Simon stood in front of the the large mash tun here. Um, that is a very large mash tun. Yeah, it's um, I say it holds seven and a half tons of grain, so um, so that's our largest mash tun. And then if I can make my way, and hopefully you can see through through here, um, we have down a bit. I've been told the wire doesn't quite go far enough, but we have another mash room through through here with um, 
with the other two mass tons in. We've got two smaller ones in there, they each hold about three and a half tons of grain. Um, and they, they work as, as together. And as you can see from um, looking around, this is a very old building. This building um, is an old stone brew house. Um, it's, we're on the third floor here. There's two more floors above us um, where we've got the mill room and everything um, above us here. So it's an old tower style brew house. Um, the actual building dates back from the late, from the late uh, 19th century. Um, so, you know, it's over 100, well over 100 years old, the building that we're, we're studying and brewing today. So, um, uh, it'd be nice to have a brand new, nice building, but um, it wouldn't quite have the character of what we've got here, I don't think. Fantastic. Yeah, really. Do you get burned often, walking around all those pipes and mesh tons and stuff? <laughs> Um, no, we try not to, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your insurance company, your insurance carrier is glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm sure they are. Especially <laughs> live online. No, that never happens. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got a. You're scheduled for a 60-minute boil on this, then, as well. Um, we like to only boil for 45 minutes. Is our standard boil. I, I, I just standardize the recipe around 60 minutes because I know that's what people, um, you know. Would, would, um, associate with. So we, we'll actually only boil for 45 minutes and that's, that's our standard sort of process and, and we don't plan to do anything different on this day. Yet, so. um, but we'll be running off now for about another, I would suggest about another hour it'll take us to um, to, to fill the, the copper behind us now. So um, I think we're coming towards the end of our time so we'll be able to just uh, carry on that process and, uh, and tune into what, uh, what other people are doing as well. So. Well, and I'm really anxious because uh, Bill is going to finish his day and go home and join us later on in the program with a cold beer in his hand. I so I tried the technology last night and it wasn't helping me, but um, I, I, I didn't have this laptop at home, so hopefully when I take this home and, and link up, I'll be uh, I'll be fine for later on. Well, good. Well, we have, we're we're looking forward to seeing you again. So. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for participating today in the big step off. We really appreciate having you. This was the perfect way to kick off with our favorite brewery in the UK, Brains Brewing, Craft Brewing in Cardiff. Um, we are going to turn the reins over to Master Brewing now. Matt and Gil, who is our guest for Master Brewing? Well, uh, his, his, we'll let Simon introduce him before they sign off here because Simon knows them better. They're also in the UK. Okay. Okay, I'd, I'd like to say thank you to Bill for, yeah, thank you, Simon. for, for doing this kind of little collaboration here. Thanks everybody else. It's my third collaboration brew with Brains, Barry Island, BKT, Triple IPA, Double IPA, Triple IPA, and now we're doing the big sipper. But um, Dean and Richard, if you're there, you have to unmute, have to unmute yourself. I'll. Um, Dean, I know you guys, I, I know Richard, how are you doing? Yes, good, thank you. Um, what stage are you at at your brewery? We're still, we've still got the mash in, uh, we're waiting for the full conversion, and then we'll be transferring to the copper. Fantastic, and would you like to show us around your brewery? Uh, well, there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping Tara now has another new favorite uh, brewery in the UK. I don't think I, she knew you were in the UK when she said that. I actually didn't. <laughs> you are, I will we say this. I'm in love with this little brewing system you have right there. I've been coveting it since you guys got on. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> I, I wish I could fit it somewhere in my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, sure, it fit in your garage. <laughs> garage. <laughs> I think it would. There's plenty of room in there. <laughs> That's fantastic. So where in the UK are you guys? We're in Wellington, uh, Somerset, the southwest. Um, our closest cities are Exeter and Bristol. Okay. And actually, Cardiff is, as the crow flies. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Not too far from Cardiff. It's just over the, the River Severn. If you guys Google um, the River Seven, you'll see that um, 
Taunton is directly across from, from Cardiff where we are, so we can kind of wait for them guys over the channel. But um, guys, we're, um, what kind of beers have you been? You've been brewing some really kind of funky IPAs at the moment. I really enjoyed your mango IPA. Um, have, you, have you still got some of that for sale? Yeah, we still got some of that in bottles. So uh, if you want any more, Simon, it's here waiting for you. Brilliant. <laughs> well, did you have to um, get the mangoes? Here? Was it, it was a dwarf. Was it a mango dwarf? Was it IPA? Hawaiian dwarf, wasn't it? It was, was Hawaiian. That? Did you have to get the, the mangoes in? Did you have to order them in, or were they readily available? Sorry? Did we have to order the mangoes in, or were they readily available? Oh, no, we had to order them in. Okay. Fantastic. And uh, I also did a collaboration with the Master Brewery back in April, um, inspired by Stone Brewing in America, who brewed a, a mint chocolate imperial stout late 2012. Um, Masters approached me to do a collaboration with them and they said, what do you want to brew? And I said, well, let, why don't we brew a, a mint chocolate imperial stout? And to my amazement, they said, yes, yeah, straight away. We're going to get some black chocolate, some dark chocolate. There it is there. Um, and we're going to get some fresh mint. And they got fresh oats and fresh malt and fresh hops. And it was just a great day. You can also catch that on my YouTube channel. Uh, just, just type in Masters Mint Chocolate Imperial Stout. But I'll let you guys ask some uh, questions for the Masters Brewery now. I'll step back a little bit and let you carry on. You can ask the question. How long have you guys been brewing? Uh, I've actually been brewing since 1999. Um, our little brew house here, though, we've had for 18 months now. Fantastic. And where is that brew house from, this brew system? Is it, uh, who makes it? Was, it? <laughs> it was built locally. Um, okay. A friend of ours built it uh, 20 minutes from our brewery here. Uh, That's he built, fantastic. Yeah, he builds a lot of breweries. That's his business. And uh, we had one of his first of this type. So he regularly visits and just sees how we're getting on. Awesome. Well, we love shameless self-promotion here, so if you have any more to tell us, like, any information about him, we would love to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Brewery for Sales, breweryforsale.co.uk, you'll find him and all these uh, various plants that he makes. He's just awesome. finished a one-barrel version of this. Very cool. So that would really fit in your garage. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I'll make room for it. Yeah. <laughs> it's really, I mean, it really is. It's beautiful. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's super. We're very pleased with it. We're now on uh, 318 brews on this one now. Fantastic. So what is the most popular beer that you guys put out? What is the most well-received Masters brewing uh, beer? Uh, we, it's our, first, our very first brew, which was Spy Post Bitter. Um, we'll show you a bottle of that if we can. Uh, Dean's just getting this one. Five. And that's a 4% session bitter. Um, nice. Inoffensive in both ways, not too bitter, not too hoppy, and it suits the palate round here. It's a traditional sort of local ale. Awesome. Uh, do you have any other really popular styles that you guys are putting out? Well, we've just done this, the one Simon was talking about, which is our double IPA, 7.5% uh, um, with a new funky label, and that's been been huge for us. That's awesome. I love y'all's labels. Those are pretty fantastic. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool, that one. Um, we're working on a, an old English ale at the moment, and... Um, <laughs> nice. Promoting the UK in some way. <laughs> Absolutely. Local farmhouse honey. That sounds very delicious. Yeah, yeah. Superb beer. Awesome. Ashley, did you have a question? Yeah, I love that system. I think you said you can get a barrel version, but how many barrels is that one? Sorry, how? Many barrels? Two and a half barrel. Okay. Yeah, I want one for myself at home, but I want the smaller version. 
<laughs> Matt and Gil, you guys have any questions? Gil. <laughs> Sorry, we got muted again into technical stuff here. Uh, but you, you do a lot of. Uh, I'm gonna ask the same question I asked for uh, for praise because that's something that I was. I, I always have this vision about uh, UK beers and uh, this kind of beer seems such a different thing for me that you guys have done. And uh, do you have the same experience as Brains? Do you be doing more more IPAs, more hoppy beers on your brewery as well? Um, yeah, yeah, we, we've started to do those kind of beers. Um, we've actually freed ourselves up a little bit now because we don't supply to pubs, to local pubs, um, which is what we did first of all, putting beer into casks. And most landlords want low gravity, uh, inoffensive beers because that's what they want to sell and they can sell that easily in their pub. Uh, since we got our bottling line, we can go a bit crazy now. So we've done the 10% mint chocolate stout. We can get away with a 7.5 IPA because it's all internet sales. So it's it's a completely different direction for us as soon as we got our bottling line in. That's fantastic. This so, mint chocolate stout just sounds so phenomenal. Was this for you to get all the ingredients for the sipa? Sorry, what was that? Thing? I didn't get that. Sorry, one. we didn't get that one. Did uh, it was difficult at all to get all the ingredients for the sipa? Where did you get all the ingredients for the sipa? It wasn't difficult to get it. What for for the brew we're doing now? Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, it really was because um, when we had the phone call yesterday that we'd be involved in this, we had no grain on site. So what we've been doing is beg, borrowing, and stealing from all the little local breweries around here. So I think we've been a real pain in the butt to them. We try and uh, borrow all the bits and pieces we've needed. But we, we managed it. We're there. <laughs> that's awesome. That's the reason I asked. Because it's even more collaborative. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, we're surrounded by some fabulous breweries, and they're all huge compared to us. And they see us as the little baby brewery. And it's Aww. almost a case of, oh, let them have it. Let them have it. So it's, <laughs> it's been really good because they don't see us as a threat, I think. <laughs> how's the, um, Richard, how has the uh, mint chocolate imperial stuff been going? It's, I've, not, I, I've not kind of, it's been a few months. Is it, is it selling really well? Yeah, it's, it's selling steadily. Uh, a lot of people are afraid of it. As soon as they see 10%, um, it's also rather expensive for a 330 mil bottle because the, the duty on it is rather high um, and it puts a few people off, but once they've tried it, they certainly come back for more. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be a good beer for us. Do you think it'll be a bit of a slow burner? It'll be kind of word of mouth. People will start talking about it around Christmas time, perhaps brew it again for, for a kind of a big Christmas push. Is that how you see it going? Um, no, we don't sort of see it like that. We want to keep this as like um, a real specialist brew. Uh, we've done 1,200 bottles of it, each one individually numbered. And I don't think we're going to do it again. We'll keep it like that so people got almost a collector's item, if you like. Yeah, and yeah I got then you. Then we'll do something a little bit different, something a little bit more unusual, but along the same lines, and try it again. Fantastic. Maybe a, maybe a Belgian double or something like that. Yeah, something like that would be fantastic. Yeah. But you brew, um, I know that because I tried it on site at the brewery. You brew a fantastic German style Hefeweizen. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I worked in Germany for a little while at uh, a little tiny brewery in Krausheim near Munich and uh, got to know the brewmaster very well and he shared this recipe with us. And um, and we now brew it to their specification, and it and it comes out real good, real good. It's very popular here. As mm. soon as we've got it on our hand pools in our bar, it flies out the door. It's really popular. And and what's your experience with brewing? Do you want to go from the start when you first got into brewing to where you are today? All the different companies you work for, where you travel in the world. Yeah, uh, I got into brewing in a strange kind of way. Uh, I owned a manufacturing company 
and we made promotional products for a brewing for the brewing industry. Um, I did a lot of work for a little tiny brewery, and unfortunately, when it came to the uh, the bill presented to them, they couldn't afford it. Uh, it. This sounds callous, but it's not. It was over a long period of time, and in the end, they said to settle the bill, could, would we have their brewery? And um, and I said yes. I knew nothing about brewing at the time, and we put that in our factory. And I spent more time brewing than I ever did making promotional products. <laughs> so <laughs> from there, um, life takes funny paths, and uh, all that had to be sold, and the manufacturing company went. But it gave me then chance to travel the world, which I did. I travelled around um, Germany and America brewing. Came back here in November of 2011 and built what you see today. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. And the, the name is your surname? Yeah, uh, Masters Brewery is us, Dean and Richard Masters. Uh, the name's quite strong right here, so we thought it would be a fitting name for the brewery. Fantastic, fantastic. Okay, I'll leave some more questions for you guys in America. Matt, Gil, Alan, questions? I'm right now, I'm just drilling. I, I can't get over how pretty that system behind him is. This I think we're all just kind of starstruck. It is very yeah. pretty. We're used oh. to a lot of uh, like the Franken systems here, and a lot of the small craft breweries kind of put together pieces and parts from other breweries, and uh, that is just it's very pretty. <laughs> yeah. Well, the great thing about this brewery is it's on a cradle. It's all fitted onto this frame. And um, when it was delivered, uh, we brought it in with a forklift. We just plugged the power in, plugged the water in, and we brewed the same the same afternoon that it was delivered. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Can show you the fermenters. Our fermenters are over here. Um, whether Dean can show you those. Yeah, there we uh, go. <laughs> Wood grain. Again, beautiful. You're saying if we broke in there with the tractor trailer, we could have the whole thing out of there before you ever knew it was gone? <laughs> <laughs> what was the address? What we're, what, <laughs> Just, what we're going to try is tell you um, if team can disconnect things and wander around. That would be awesome. Yeah. Uh oh. We lost. Oh. They'll come back, they'll come back in a we moment. We lost them for a moment. Um, yeah. I'd like to ask Matthew, um, are you enjoying it at this stage? What's that? Are you enjoying it at this stage? Oh, heck yeah, this is a great time. Oh, there they're back. Yeah, we're yeah. back. We're back. Right. What we're gonna don't, try, don't touch that cable again. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to try and do is show you our pub, if, um, if you'd like to see what we've done in there. We would yeah. love to see the pub. Okay. I would love to at least. I don't yeah. know about everyone else. <laughs> right. See how we go here. Right. What kind of view have we got? Right. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Woodyard Brew Pub. There's something charming about you get like a British pub, doesn't it? Yeah. The dark wood and the warm lighting. Yeah. It's pretty fantastic. Now this this is built in a modern industrial unit, um, and people are surprised when they come to our pub because it's like stepping back in time is what they say. Um, we've salvaged all our bits and pieces from different pubs and hotels and things, okay. um, and it really makes it authentic. Why don't All you these hand pumps are gorgeous. Yeah, I was going to say, pull us a pint. <laughs> I can do that. I hate to twist your arm like that, you know. <laughs> Very nice. Is there a way that you can FedEx that over to Minnesota in the United States? <laughs> Immediately. <be> <laughs> I'll, t I'll tell you what, guys. I'll do one better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
we lost our connection. Whoa, <laughs> guess we're going to have to boot him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the Saison. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. The... Is there anything special about it, or is it just kind of a traditional Saison? It's, it's a traditional tra Saison as far as we are concerned. We have added yeah. um, ginger, coriander, and orange to, to this one, and it, it's just a wonderful pint. It really goes well on the bar. Uh, it's new for us, and customers really appreciate it. It's a real nice beer. It probably goes well with the hot weather that you've got there now, right? Oh, I mean, absolutely, yeah. yeah. A absolutely. Uh, we serve this around about 10 degrees, so um, it it's cool for a real ale, and customers appreciate that. Awesome. That's, a, that's something a little different and really neat. Did you yeah. say you had a flagship beer that was a half of Weizen or something? Yeah, we, we do have a, a German wheat. Uh, this is it here. Um, I'll show you what this one looks like. You're just showing off now. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> that is a fantastic Beautiful. Beer. I can vouch for that. That's one of their best beers, if you don't mind me saying, Richard. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it is. It's very good. Nice head. There's a sweet dish. Awesome. Right, we'll go back. we're going back to the brewery now. Richard, before you do that, show us your old fireplaces and what have you gone out of there now. Right, I'll just run you around the, the bar quickly. So, obviously, here's our bar fireplace. and everything. And here is our old fireplace that we took out of a hotel. Oh, wow. So here's our, our old fireplace. <laughs> Don't drop it, Dean. Do not drop it. <laughs> yeah, and all the ornate carving in the top of the overmantel there. And then we've got the other side. Just, hello. Just... Yeah, so that's our nice little pub. That's really classy. I like that. Right, back to the brewery. I mean, guys. So people that drink craft beer in the UK, do they see the light of the day at all? Or they just get up around 6 in the, in the afternoon and just go to the pub and then that's it? <laughs> uh, it all depends, really, on the person. We get people in that, that, that are the late drinkers and we get people in that, that are all day drinkers, you know? As, as far as we're concerned, beer is an all-day drink, you know. We brew a beer with coffee in that we have for our morning wake-up. Instead of a cup of coffee, we have a coffee beer. <laughs> Beer's all, every time is a perfect time for beer. Right. Right, and let me just put you guys down a second. Put everything back up. <laughs> was it, did you say that that was a one or, was that a two-barrel system you were working with it there? Two and a half. Two and a half? Okay. Yeah. Do you guys brew every day? <laughs> no, we brew. Uh, we do a double brew every week, once a week. So. Um, I saw you had some IPAs. Do you do any stouts? Sorry. Say that again, Ash. Do you do any stouts? Imperial Stout, delicious beers. Well, yeah, our, um, the one we co-brewed with Simon, our mint chocolate Imperial Stout, was our main stout that we did. Um, <laughs> we, we've been looking at doing a few more recently, but um, we brew for what our clientele fancy, and in, in this kind of weather, they're not particularly fond of the dark, heavy beers. So at the moment, all of our beers are IPAs, IPA styles, and, and the Saison particularly. You can send me a few bombers of that chocolate mint imperial stout if people won't drink that. I mean, yeah. I'd sign me up. <laughs> You're about the, the 20th person to have said that. So it's growing list. I think we're all pretty ecstatic about the idea of that beer. <laughs> it sounds quite delicious. It's something that... Um, if, I, if I constantly look at what you guys do in America, um, you brew a bit of imperial stouts, orange imperial stouts, double IPAs, IPAs. Whenever I get asked to, to go and do a collaboration, I always kind of look to America, even though I'm in the UK. 
because you guys for me are at, at one stage or kind of six, always six months to a year ahead of us in craft beer. So, so it was great again. It was like being fast forwarded it one year ahead when these guys said, Yes, we'll brew this mint chocolate imperial stuff. Um, and yeah. It seems to be going well, but I reckon it would do even better in America. What do you reckon, Richard? I'm sorry, Simon. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've just had customers come into the bar, and I've just had to serve them a pint. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying, Richard, um, the Imperial Stouts in America, the Mint Chocolate Imperial Stouts, I always look to America to they got these great styles that always been very inventive. And to kind of hit you with the idea of we're an imperial mid chocolate imperial stout, it seems like it's doing great in the UK, but it would do much better in America. Oh, absolutely, I think so. Um, Americans seem to take to these kind of strange brews and um, take them to their heart. The, the British are a bit more reserved, and um, it's like, whoa, ten percent, um, you know. <laughs> where's my four percent bland beer, please? You know, um, we've almost got to force it on them. Um, but Americans seem to take to this these things so well. So yeah, I think in America this would be huge. Well, I, I think I, we can all agree with that. <laughs> I can say I like these things, but but I wouldn't mind sitting at that bar and drinking a nice British bitter too. So, you know, yeah, I, yeah. You there's know. a place there's a place for it all. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Do we have any more questions? We had Jeffrey Davis join us. Um, Jeff, right now we are with Masters Brewing. Did you have any questions for that? Oh, sounds awesome. I'd, I'd be really keen to try some of their beer on cask if I could ever find that over in the UK. You know? yeah. 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 Well, um, unfortunately, we don't do so much cask these days. Um, I think I told you guys that earlier on. Um, we, since the bottling line, we've sort of not, we don't do so much cask for customers outside of our own bar. Uh, that does two things for us. That makes our cask beer fairly exclusive, so customers come here to try it, so it keeps our bar, bar busy, um, and, and bottling is easier for us to deal with. And I have to come to your bar, I guess. <laughs> Absolutely, there's a stool waiting for you. <laughs> awesome. Do you guys actually use the fireplaces in there? Are they working fireplaces? Oh, it is, yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a proper burner. Yeah, in the winter, uh, it's fantastic. In Christmas time, it was lovely. We had it decorated, and uh, my mum actually found me some old paper uh, Christmas trimmings and decorations to hang from the ceiling, so it looked so authentic. It was just fabulous. That sounds very idyllic. I love yeah. it. <laughs> great. It was really great. Richard, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask from your end, from Masters Brewery to, to the breweries in America? Uh, oh, you've, you've hit me with one now, Simon. Um, I would have needed time to plan that, that one. There must be so many. Um, but off the top of my head, I just can't think of one. Um, you well, come back to that question. Well, you, you have five minutes for that. And yeah. we'll come back to on that question, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so where, where do you know on the brewing process? Well, we're still waiting for the conversion of the mash. Uh, we're not far away now. I don't have any, how much time you guys have got with us now. In about five minutes, we're going to be heading over to, well, not heading over, Ashley's there right now, but we're going to be handing over the reins to Conquest Brewing in a few minutes here. All uh, right. Well, we've got, we've still got another 15 minutes of the mash yet, so okay. uh, we won't be transferring yet for at least 15 minutes. But once we do, uh, because our plant is so small, we'll be catching you all up. So um, we won't be far behind. Awesome. That sounds good. Matthew Gill, do you have any questions? I was just wondering, uh, you know, uh, 
Do you want to tell us a little bit the, the you know, the making of the SIPA on your brewery, how you guys are doing this, and uh, what are you expecting out of, you know, how different do you think the taste is going to be if you if you walk into each other's breweries? Do you think the, the taste from the SIPA from Rains and, and yours, do you think they're going to be very far apart, or are they going to be close enough? Um, no, I've always been of the opinion that uh, no matter if you try a different recipe on another brewery, it's going to taste different. It won't be the same. We've got water, different water. We've got different way the plant runs. Um, and I, I think we could probably get close, but I, I think it'd be interesting to test all the beers together and just see whether they are the same. Um, um, I'm not sure. I, I don't. I don't think they will be. They'll have all their little nuances from each different brewery. Very yeah. true. I think that's part of the fun thing, having the big sipa in all these different places. Is we're going to see yeah. it come out a few different ways, and I'm hoping yeah. that a lot of us can figure out how to get our hands on the different beers too. So uh, we'll see, and it'll be exciting when we all come back and taste it together. Yeah. How it turned out. We have a lot of customers that say that they can taste the master's beer. Uh, it's got a particular flavor. Now, whether that's because we use local water or whatever, um, I'm not really sure. We haven't been able to put our finger on why ours is different than somebody else's. And, um, so that's what I'm thinking is that there are little nuances in all these all these recipes and all these breweries that, that, that does make it a little bit different one from another. Yeah, yeah. So there are, we have that. There are, we always talk about there are a few breweries here in the U.S. that you drink their beers and you know that some breweries it's not like that, but there are a few brewers that you know how their beer tastes. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think like I think Sierra Nevada is one of the biggest examples of that. When I pick up a Sierra Nevada, a Sierra Nevada beer and drink it, I know that I'm drinking something from their brewery. Each and every time, it does not fail the style or anything. I can taste when it comes from, and it's a good thing. I mean, it's the compliment because all of it is very delicious. But it's one of those things uh, when someone says, "Oh, this is a pale ale," you take one drink of it, and it's a Sierra Nevada pale ale. You you just know that. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right. I think that is true, and we've had it said to us many times. So, and I and I see it as a compliment. So yeah, yeah, it's right. It is. It means you have great quality control if it's all coming out that consistent. Yes. <laughs> well, you just saw you just saw a bit of my quality quality control. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I should be finishing that pint in a minute. <laughs> I don't blame you. <laughs> awesome. Well, we are at eleven fourteen. At eleven fifteen, we're supposed to be handing it over to Ashley at Conquest Brewing. Miss Ashley, are you ready to turn on your mic and chat with us? Oh, we're getting there. We're we're quite the close. Quite the close in the. Awesome. So you guys have been brewing already. Yes. We're almost done. Oh, fantastic. Well, that's exciting, too. How has the brew gone so far? Great. We've, uh, we've really enjoyed it. It's, it smells really awesome in the, uh, in the kettle over there. Um, I love these hops. Uh, no Ashley actually, and I had that conversation earlier. I yeah. love the smell of brewing in the morning. I'm kind of jealous that I'm not one of the people at a brewery right now, smelling all of that sweet wort. It is not fair. Uh, one day they'll improve the webcam so that you can actually get the smell of the mash over the over the, the hangout. Nice. <laughs> Matthew. Oh, so who do we have from Conquest Brewing? What are your names? I'm Joseph, um, and this is Matt. Matthew. How's it going? And uh, we're just about to finish up. When the loud beep happens, we'll have to go add some more. Um, but uh, we have a show with our distributor today, so we had to be out of here by 12.30. Um, so that's why we're about to finish up right now. Uh, can I ask a question to you with Conquest? What's that? Can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, what size is your plant there? And could you show us around the plant? We have a three barrel brew house. And we have four six barrel fermenters. 
110 and 115. So we actually produce about 21 barrels a week in a three barrel brew house. So we're brewing a lot. Uh, we are currently saving up for a 15 barrel and we are um, pretty close. We need for a 15 barrel and we're getting close right now for that. But yeah, we're very small. We've only been brewing since January. You go to January, but it sounds like you're a very progressive brewery. Um, it's very successful there. Is that, is that right? Well, really, uh, we're, really, that out. we're the very first production brewery in our city. Wow. So, wow. So nobody, nobody else. So, you know, not only do we have to make good beer and give a good first impression, but, uh, but it, the way was pretty paved for us because there was nobody else around to satisfy that desire. Um, there are a couple others in planning right now, but um, but we're the first ones, and, and I don't think the other ones will be open until next summer sometime. Um, so we're all alone right now in the city. Fantastic. So when, where are you in the process, in the in the big sipper process, brewing today? Oh, uh, we're um we're in the whirlpool right now. We're almost done. We had to start early this morning, um, so we could get done because we have a big expo with our distributor this afternoon that we have to be at. Oh. At and how does the work taste? What's that? How did the work taste? I haven't tasted it yet. We've got our sample sitting over there for the um, for the hydron reading. It's cooling right now, um, so I haven't tasted it yet, but I will. But it smells good. We haven't done our final hop edition yet, so we won't. Uh, we probably won't taste the work until after that. What are you drinking Ed, there, Edward? Uh, why don't you guys? You know, you guys are new, um, and, I, and I have to admit, I'm uh, I'm from enemy territory. I live north of the border in North Carolina, so I have not had your beers yet. But um, you know, I think you guys got a lot of help from uh, the community. You know, as as you started up, I, I know you guys are friends with Edward and Morgan at Westbrook, and I think you know, I think some of the other breweries might have helped you out. Can you just tell a little bit about the story of how? How you guys got started and what kind of support you did get from the other breweries in the area? Yeah, um, so we uh, we've actually been home brewers um, for about nine years. Um, we've been brewing together. We started developing the recipes specifically for um, this project um, about two and a half years ago. Um, and Edward and Morgan, uh, we've known since they opened up. I worked at the largest craft beer store here in town, and so I knew a lot of the craft beer fans around town and also knew the brewers from other breweries because of that. Um, and that's how, how I got in touch with Edwin and Morgan. Um, we know Holy, the guys at Holy City down in, uh, in Charleston as well. Most of the breweries in South Carolina are in the Charleston area, and there's a couple in Greenville, um, a couple of new ones in Greenville. But, um, but yeah, when we were um, trying to scale up our recipes uh, to you know, from a homebrew system to the three barrel, which isn't that big of a scale up, but it's still um, significantly different. Um, we got a lot of advice from Edward. We've gotten a lot of um, advice on uh, on hop aroma and flavor from um, David down at Coast Brewing Company, who's also in, in North Charleston. Um, he's uh, he's a cell phone on speed dial. I can call him anytime and ask him uh, ask him any questions. And he and his wife Jamie, um, they actually we we are right. You guys probably wouldn't know, but we are about 500 feet from the, uh, the football stadium here in town, the University of South Carolina. Um, and so David actually rent a tailgating spot here in our parking lot every South Carolina. So we'll be hanging out a whole lot with them um, this fall. But yeah, the breweries have all been very, uh, very helpful to us, giving us advice. Aspect of the process in the larger system. Um, there's a really good community in South Carolina of the breweries um, that we all go to and take over breakfast the next morning. But uh, but they've been they've been awesome. I think that's awesome that you know people view it as as family and helping helping the industry uh, as opposed to new competition. So I'm glad to hear that uh, that it, that's the way it played out. And that's actually not a unique thing. We have that in Minnesota too. We've got a ton of new breweries that are open. Hello, dog. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's a lot of breweries that are actually working together. Um, in fact, there's one group uh, 
uh, direct to consumer uh, tap room where two or three of the other commercial brewers came to help him install all his fermenters, his brew equipment, and even helped him get trained in on the equipment. I mean, what other industry does that where you actually have your quote unquote competitors come in and help you get, you know, settled in on your system and familiar with it. I mean, well, a huge one for us um, too is with this brew specifically, Noda up in Charlotte. We got to give them a shout out because we, being brand new in January, we can't get hops right now, especially the rare varieties. Um, we are only able to do the big sipa because I called up Noda and they offered to get us some Simcoe and Amarillo, and um, they wouldn't take any money for it. They just want beer in return. But um, so Noda. Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I saw your I saw your tweet of that, so that is pretty cool. Yeah. You know, you know, tell us a little bit about your other beers, like your flagship beers, and what you what you what you're doing right now that people are really looking forward when it comes to it. So we brew. Um, we have three flagships that we brew all the time. Um, one is a, a blonde ale. It's 4.2 percent. It's light. It's got some wheat malt in it. Um, we use a lot of Velma hops, which is a new hop from um, Pewterball Farms, um, and it's a very pineapple-y, um, tropical kind of hop. We use that one for the late hop edition in the in the blonde to give it some complexity. Um, so it's a good introductory beer for non-craft beer drinkers, but it's also light and refreshing for craft beer drinkers. It's a little bit like, if, if I could give you a comparison that you probably had, it's somewhat like Oberon from Bell's, um, but it has a little more of a tropical uh, hop character to it. Um, we also brew an IPA. It's um, it's uh, more of an East Coast style IPA. It's balanced. It's not really bitter. Um, and uh, and we use Belma and Zythos um, and more of the uh, kind of mango pineapple hop character is what we're going for in that one. And then we brew a sweet stout um, called Medusa that is um, it's not a milk stout. We don't use lactose to sweeten it. We just use a high a high mash temperature. Um, we mash it at 156 the whole time. And um, and it leaves it finishes at 10:20, so it, it leaves uh, a lot of residual sugars in the beer. Those are our three year rounds. We've, um, we've I can't even keep track of how many beers we've brewed so far. Um, as far as experimental beers, one-off beers, um, I think we're up at, at like 15 or 15 or 16 beers right now. Um, the one that I'm am just drinking and just spilled on the counter here, which is why Matthew disappeared, is um, is called Bipolar High Roller. It is with um, chocolate and peppers, um, and uh, we brewed. You know, a pale ale. We've got a honey wheat that's a collaboration with a local hop farmer. That's apparently what Matthew's drinking. Um, so we've done a lot of different stuff. We like to play around with it, especially with a small system when there's not a whole lot of it that you have to sell. It's pretty easy to uh, to do whatever we want to do. Um, so we're we're doing a one-off series where every couple of weeks we tap a single keg that we brewed on our little test batch system. Um, and, uh, you know, we've done a black IPA. We've got an imperial stout that we're doing um, in the next couple of weeks. So um, we've got a lot of plans and a lot of different uh, a lot of different beers coming down the pike. But so far, you know, we've got those three flagships, whatever we want to brew. So is the, you know, are, are those experimental beers, are those the Cyclops beers that you, you know, you call it on your site? So That's right. Okay. That right. bipolar high roller really sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> it's really good. That one actually um, was born out of a mistake. Um, when we were first dialing in the system, we tried to brew a batch of Medusa, and um, and we, you know we missed our gravity, so it was low. And so I said, well, you know what? I'll just treat it with chocolate and peppers and see how it turns out. And of course, you know it was everybody's favorite beer, so we had to brew it again. Um, but now we're actually brewing it um, with Medusa as the base recipe, and then um, and then using chocolate and uh, and habanero Scotch bonnets. Um, and, uh, and doing an extraction on those, and then and putting in. It's pretty hot. A lot of people end up leaving some on the bar because they can't handle it. But um, but it's it's about where we want it. We're gonna make an imperial version of it as well. Um, that will be way hotter. It'll be yeah. it'll be uh, for chili heads. I'm I'm down with that. I am down with that. I gotta get some of that. So that sounds amazing. Yeah. I'm taking it. Yeah, I, I had a beer called. Uh, one Morietta, then I, it just burned me inside out. It was like chewing two things. So I had two, and I said, who, who can I break with this? So I sent a friend, and I changed gas. <laughs> I almost <laughs> killed him. <laughs> There's one called Ghost Face Killer that I've had that I was the only one in the room that could drink it. It's made with boot jalokias. 
um, the ghost pepper. That's our timer, Matt. He's going to dump some hops in. But, right. uh, but yeah, that beer is brutal, but I really enjoyed it. I'm, but I'm a chili head. So. Yeah, me too. What's your strategy with the Cyclops? You know, a lot of guys do, uh, you know, on their test system, they try stuff, you know, every couple of weeks, and then if it if it's popular, they 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 scale it up to the big system. Do you guys, you know, plan to possibly do that in the future? Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. Um, and uh, we uh, we did the first um, first test batch of our Imperial Stout, which is called Brutus. It's a it's ten and a half percent. Um, and we actually we didn't want to waste the leftover sugars, um, so we brewed the Black IPA as a party guile off of that. And that's probably what we're gonna do on the full. Cool scale system as well, um, brew a 4% uh, a session black IPA, and it was um, it was almost like hop tea. I mean, it was really hoppy, but um, of course it sold out in 45 minutes, so everybody seemed to like it. Um, but yeah, we'll probably, we, we use the test batch system for that, and if it's a failure, it's a failure, and you know, we won't brew it, um, but if it's something that the community seems to like, we'll probably make it again. That's kind of the idea behind that. Would you, would you ever imagine doing a, a barrel aged Brutus? Oh yeah, we've actually got a. Um, well, we're building a barrel room. We haven't built it yet. Um, we uh, we have two small fermenters on the way that we're going to use for the Cyclops, so we can actually do one three barrel batch instead of instead of just the uh, the five gallon batch. Um, but uh, as soon as those get here, we're going to build a room for them that's climate controlled, um, and then we're also going to put in um, some barrels in there. We, uh, we have an Imperial Stout that we've brewed um, only on a small scale that we will be brewing full scale um, as soon as those fermenters come in because it takes about six months, but um, that one's called The Finisher. It's a 17.5% Imperial Stout brewed with um, brown sugar and honey um, and finished with a champagne yeast just to, to get it that high. Um, Ooh, yeah. But that one we'll do both a uh, version and we'll do a barrel-aged version of that, probably barrel-aged brews. We love barrel-aged beer. Um, Westbrook is one that's done a whole lot of barrel aged beers and they've been really good. Um, so, yeah, we love barrel aged beers. We'll do it. Well, I'm having my first beer of the day here in the UK. I think we should all raise our glasses and say cheers. But mine's empty. Yours is empty. Go and fill it up. <laughs> uh, Ash, is there is there a way uh, to walk with the laptop around a little bit so we can see their, their brewer of the beer? Um. Yeah, there's a little bit of a cord on this webcam. I can kind of, it'll be a little shaky, but. That's all right. We all got motion sickness uh, at Masters there, but <laughs> it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Can you see the system here? Laura, I think we need to tilt down a little. How's that? Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Yeah, it's, it's adorable. I love it. <laughs> can, he t can he tell us about what he has there in the system. Yeah, have him walk us through from hot liquor on. See this, and that way I can see what I'm showing. I can do what? I'm doing this, and that way I can kind of see what I'm showing off. Yeah. Tell us what we're seeing. And then there's the tasting room over here. Hey, guys. Sorry to make you work on Saturday. Thank you. <laughs> they always work on Saturday. Oh, all right. I don't feel so bad then. Our tasting room's actually open right now, but all the bodyguards behind are there for a while. <laughs> yeah. Bodyguards. Awesome. So, can we cut back over to Masters real quick if he can even hear us and, and ask what's going on there? You're muted, Masters. Unmute. And then tell us what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody help me. There should be a red button on the top with a microphone. Just touch. Just touch it. Yeah. Oh, that, not that one. No. That one. no. <laughs> red it's red. Red. <laughs> All right. We'll try again if he if he makes his oh, way back yeah, to yeah. us. Ah, you're just, back. You just have to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> we're not hearing you, Dean. We're not hearing you. Right, there we are. We're back. There we go. Back here. Here we go. This is what happens when I leave my father with technology. <laughs> 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 I broke it. I broke it. 
Ouch. That's great. We're just transferring to the copper at the moment, so the pump's going to kick in and uh, be noisy. So uh, whether that'll drain you guys out or us out, whatever. Awesome. Well, we just wanted to check in. We saw you looking over your little brew system there quite a bit. And we also wanted to thank you again for participating in this. We really appreciate it. No and way. we are excited to have you back when the beer is done and see how it turned out. Looking forward to it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. So the Conquest guys... Um, Where's the rest of the crew? There's a few. Yeah, yeah, everybody left. They just got on camera and then they went back to work. They got to work. Yeah, <laughs> it took too long. You have to have a beard to be on camera. Is that how it works? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> what are you Sorry. drinking? They were going to do a toast, and so they came out for the toast. Oh, oh okay. Oh, do a toast. Take a picture, a toast. Oh, yeah, there who's we go. Do, who's doing pictures? Uh, me, right now. Okay. <laughs> what are you guys drinking? Tell us about it, Ashley. Uh, tell us, give us a delightful scale value, too. Uh, I've got the bipolar high roller. Um, it's spicy and delicious. The chocolatiness, you know, right up front and follow trail fire right now, and I'm loving it. Um, I definitely give it a 4.7. I don't know if it's delightful. The scale is one of my favorites after beer. All right, it's a, yeah, you're totally. <laughs> 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 ah, well, that's cool. And uh, it's a good thing you're not. You're, somebody, somebody's going to drive you to Charlotte for this afternoon, right? So. That's the great thing about this year is you blow off the bottle. Only five percent. Yeah, that's, that's your know. third one. So. <laughs> Seven <laughs> times five equals thirty-five, Ash. <laughs> it doesn't count if it's below five percent. It doesn't count. It might as well be water. Yeah. yeah. So, is your honey wheat a new thing that you guys are trying, or is that a beer you've been doing for a while? No, we just. Take that last week. Um, there's a guy. There's only one hop farm in South Carolina, um, and it's uh, in Camden, about 45 minutes from here. Um, and that guy that owns it is a friend of ours. He's actually starting a brew pub uh, over in Lexington, which is about 20 minutes from here. Um, and so he brought his own whole cone cascades, um, and we used those in that brew. And um, he designed most of the recipe. It was kind of a collaboration between him and, and, and us, and we. Uh, we kind of went through the recipe together, developed it together. Um, we used honey malt and we used um, clementines um, after the primary fermentation. Um, we used clementines and um, and uh, those uh, whole cone cascades we dry hopped with. Um, that's what you're drinking, and I'm drinking our IPA. I had to eat here last night. I thought it was better than Oberon. It's better than Oberon? Oh, no. That's what but she I, says. I thought it was better than Oberon. Good. It's an American it doesn't it, um, it's not a heavy um, Yeah. Five percent. Hey. Talk a little bit about your distribution footprint. Where can we find your beers? Are they only at your your tasting room? Are they in some local pubs and restaurants? Uh, and what are the plans for the future? So, uh, so South Carolina, it's actually illegal to self-distribute. So we cannot. Um, distribute ourselves, so we had to sign with the distributor. Um, we went with Budweiser in Columbia because they are um, the best distributor. Like I said, I worked at the largest craft beer store um, for about five years here in town, and um, they just do the best job. And uh, and everybody, all the distributors were kind of um, vying for us, us being the first um, brewery in town. Um, but we ended up going with them um, because they do a really good job. So they actually take it um, to pubs and restaurants. I can't even keep up anymore, but I know we're, um, we're in uh, several pubs around town, probably about 15 at this point, um, and then we have our tasting room here, but um, we are expanding to Greenville um, next week, I believe. We're shipping about 25 kegs up to Greenville, um, so that'll be the first city that we're that's not Columbia, um, outside of Columbia, and then as soon as we, um, we'll see, we'll kind of see, like we've only been full time at this brewery for a month. Um, we were working our 40 hour a week jobs and working here. Here, 40 hours a week at least, um, up until a while. Then is that what you say? What's that? Huh? Not being home for a while. Is that what you're trying to say? Right. <laughs> but um, so we um, yeah, we've only been we've only been uh, full time for a month, and so we're just kind of getting production ramped up um, to that uh, 21 barrels a week, which we've actually hit for the last three weeks. 
um, on the on the three barrel, and so we'll see. We'll kind of see how far we can expand with this amount of production, um, and then once we get the 15 barrel, obviously we'll go regional um, and try to uh, try to expand into into Georgia and maybe Alabama and North Carolina. So, um, but that's that's where we are right now, just just in Columbia and about to send some to Greenville. So we're working on it. So you're getting more beer out via distribution or out of your tap room. Uh, we're doing about 75% uh, distributed. So the tap room, local government getting things and everything. Um, so we ended up, uh, it ended up about months before I was open. Know what the overall uh, demand is going to be in there either, especially when football season starts. There will be 80,000 people within five square miles here, um, so we'll see what happens. We have no idea how how crazy the demand is going to be. Um, just uh, kind of plan for the best. What what are the laws in South Carolina? Can you guys sell growlers outside at a football game? Because that would be huge for you. Yeah, yeah, we can sell. Growlers. We can, but everything has to be in conjunction with a tour. Um, so the people, but it does not stipulate what the tour has to be. So people can come in and see the equipment, and that can be a tour. Um, we actually have these tour guide uh, sheets printed up that explains everything without us having to actually say it to everybody, and that way we can, you know, be assured that everybody got a tour. Um, so that's really the only stipulation. Um, once they have a tour, they can get up to three pints, which is a new law that just passed, um, what, uh, a couple weeks ago, three weeks. Yeah. Um, yeah, we couldn't we couldn't drink pints until um, actually until the tasting law passed about five years ago. It was illegal technically for a brewer to drink his own beer on his own property at all. <laughs> wow. So um, so laws are changing pretty rapidly. The South Carolina Brewers Association is doing a lot of that. That's headed up by Jamie down at Coast. Um, so they've done a lot of the. Uh, of the, the footwork on it, um, but we've been a part of the Brewers Association long before we were even um, even considering starting a brewery. We were we were lobbying for you know the alcohol cap to get raised because I don't know if you guys know, but in, until about seven years ago, um, we had a six percent alcohol cap in South Carolina. That was the highest you could have. Six percent of beer. We buy Everclear, and we went over six percent. So. You know, but now the laws, I mean, they're they're getting better. So now we can serve up the three pints. We can serve sell up to four growlers. We still can't sell kegs or anything. Um, that's largely due to the wholesalers association lobbying against it because they don't make any money on kegs we sell here. Um, but, uh, you know, they're getting better. So you don't have a 15% limit like we do in um, in North Carolina. So you can brew that big old 17% beer, huh? It's our limit. Our limit is 17.5. Um, so that's what that beer is. Okay. We're pushing the limits. Yeah. Well, the thing is, you actually have. Uh, I think there's actually a. Uh, the law has a one percent deviation from what it says on the label, so it could technically be eighteen five, and we could say it's seventeen five. I'm still selling, but one percent. So eighteen five. A is full absolutely percent. Amazing. It's just like speed limit. You can What's go that? ten over. They won't get you. Know? <laughs> yeah. oh, I know. I feel like uh, a lot of states, though, it's not a full percent range. Like it's in with a couple points of a percent. I haven't heard a full percent leeway yet. So that's interesting and awesome. Full disclosure: I drive on a speed limit. I don't drive the cannibal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't pull me over. Cause I've had an idea, oh. and I'm driving the speed limit. Hey, so talk a little bit about, you guys have this whole kind of medieval theme going on with your brand and your shirts and your blog. Are you, are you guys Dungeons and Dragons fans or something, or, or how how'd you, how'd you settle on that? We're actually not um, geeks really at all. He's a, uh, he's a scientist, so he is kind of a, a bookhead, but, um, but no, we're not, we don't, we're not gamers or anything, um, but uh, I just, we, we, we talked and, and thought for years about what the brewery would be named. Um, I had a big big sword collection at my house because I do like swords. Um, I came up with the name of Conquest and, uh, and it was really easy because it kind of writes itself as far as uh, as far as our branding goes. Um, the Sacred Heart for our IPA, that actually came from a Flogging Molly song. So we do have a lot of music influence. Sacred Heart came from a Flogging Molly song. Um, 
Rebels of the Sacred Heart. Um, it's not because we're Catholic. Um, we're not Catholic. But um, okay. the, uh, the finisher is a song by a metalcore band called Oh Sleeper, and they actually know about this beer now, are planning on meeting us. They're on the Warp Tour right now. They're planning on meeting us this summer and hanging out with us and having some pints, and we may be able to convince them to play the finisher release party come next January. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah, it would be super cool. But um, we, we know where our Ash is going to be this summer. What's that? We know where Ash is going to be this summer. Yeah. <laughs> she's going to be there a bunch this summer. Yeah. Well, she's now kind of a celebrity with you. I mean, she's got access. Just give her her own parking space, and you know. Can she get a parking plate that says "Beer Fairy" at your brewery? <laughs> that would be amazing. Well, the other thing about us <laughs> being the, um, in the football stadium area is our parking lot is actually rented out on game days. We only oh. get two spots. <laughs> that's, that's all we have. I, her because we got to be here. But as far as the medieval theme goes, it's fun. It's, uh, you know, we've got swords that we're going to hang in the tasting room and big shields and everything and, and we just we just enjoy it. It's, uh, it's just something that's... Uh, you know, we like mythology. We're big readers. Um, you know, I have literally 1,500 books at my house. Um, I like old, uh, old stuff. Um, you know, print or uh, King Arthur stuff, and you know. So, so when is the first uh, drunken sword fight in the tasting room scheduled? Yeah. You know, we've done it already. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I had, I had an extra finger on this hand. Before yeah. <laughs> So we are at 11.43 right now. I believe that means it's almost time for our home brewing session, which I know a lot of our craft beer nation viewers and the people who participate in our wonderful Google community are excited about. We have a lot of home brewers. Um, that is scheduled for 11.45, correct? Yes, ma'am. That is correct. Okay, awesome. I'm sort of on if schedule. If we could it's actually, exciting. well, <laughs> since we still have a few minutes, um, maybe... That those that are, if there are anybody watching or following Twitter, or whatever, use the hashtag the Big Sippa for posting your questions onto Twitter and Google Plus, and we'll try and work those into at the top of the hour. Yeah, definitely. We have a lot of people checking out our Facebook, our Google Plus community, our Twitter, and uh, we are looking for questions from outside of our panel that we have here. Um, other than the fact we're about to start with our home brewing, we also get to welcome Boris. Hello, Boris. How are you? And uh, and let's let's wrap with Ashley. Ashley has to drive. Oh yes, to go we do. Her. We need to send Miss Ashley, our favorite beer yeah. fairy, off. Thank you so much for heading out to Conquest. We really enjoyed meeting this fantastic brewery, and we hope all of the people in our Google Plus community in their area reach out and try their beers and support them, because that's what we do. Thank you so much, Ashley, and thank you guys for participating in the Big Sippa. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. We hope, we, uh, we hope the beer is awesome. We enjoy, enjoyed having you here in our brewery. Oh, thank you. Cheers, guys. Enjoy. And Ashley, drive safe. I'll see you, you a little bit later. Yeah. Okay, right, I got to blow out too, guys. See you later. No. Hey, see you, Jeff. All right, adios, guys. Yeah, and thank you for our viewers. I mean, I'm not disclosed the number, but you guys, it's quite a lot of people watching live now, and uh, we appreciate you guys participating on this with us. I mean, it's. Well, I, just, uh, I just posted it to my Facebook, so all my family and friends has a link to the Google Plus event page where they can just click play and watch watch us live. Uh, I'm gonna be muted a lot of the time because as you can hear, uh, they're brewing, so they got the music blaring, chillaxing. I'm having a beer. I'm having their saison. And both parties sent to Feb brewing. Yeah, we'll, we'll be back to him in about a, about a half hour. We'll talk with him and one of the brewers there. So. So has anyone started okay. pulling questions from our internet? <laughs> Not yet. Let's start it. <laughs> Michael gave the hashtag. Let me check it. Okay. Let's see if we have well, if we have well, anything we going on our Twitter. In the meantime, if we if we don't have any questions, we can actually just talk about an overview of the brewing process uh, from the perspective. I have of a the... question. Yes. If someone is doing their first home brew and they're home brewing. Can you give a kind of mm, little bit of a how-to 
on doing their yeast starter? Yeast starter. Well, um, generally speaking, uh, all right. The first thing you need to know is what you think your starting gravity is. There's two different readings. You're going to have a starting gravity reading, which is the weight of the sugar and water. Um, and then you're going to have your terminal gravity reading, which is at the end of fermentation. Mm -hmm. What you're going to need is a basic hydrometer. And there are, it's, this is, yeast starters are going to be a little bit more complicated. Um, so, way to dive in, Tara. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, it's, no, you're, it um, seems like a good place to start, though. I mean, it's it, something it that is. has to be in, done in before fact, you start brewing, correct? In fact, so. if, if, when, if you're planning on brewing a bigger beer like the Big Sippa, um, mm -hmm. like my starting gravity is going to probably be around 1065, so it's a good, uh, it's a good gravity level to do a starter. And to do it, you um, the easiest way you take a cup of dry malt extract, just light dry malt extract, and you reconstitute it back into about, um, say, 14 to 1600 milliliters of water, and use like a grad big one of those big graduated flasks, mm -hmm. and you bring that up to a boil for about 15 minutes, chill it, uh, and then pitch your yeast into that, and let that basically sit for about 24 to 48 hours at the most. Um, if you have a stir plate, a stir plate is basically has a, a fan inside with a spinning magnet, Fire and it spins tape. a little magnetic stir stir bar inside your flask, and will that kind of generates and agitates the yeast, and will cause it to um, act, ferment more actively. So, but you let that go for up to 48 hours. 24 hours is pretty good too, um, and then you pitch that into your cooled work on brew day. So that's awesome. that's all that really is involved in starters. For higher gravity, as as the gravity level of your beer goes up, so like if you're doing a Russian Imperial Stout and you've got an original gravity of you know 1080, 1090, you might actually use a little bit bigger yeast starter. So you might actually do um, 2,000 or 2,400 milliliters of water and two cups of dry malt extract. Do you normally boil it straight on the flask on a on a flask, or you in a pan and then you pour it in? Which I'm is, sorry. Which is safer to do it straight on the flask? Uh, you boil the right on the flask, or you? I I personally boil in a in a little kettle. I don't boil my flask, but that's just my own personal <laughs> preference. But uh, it's big. One other thing about homebrewing is uh, cleanliness and sanit sanitation. The, that is super amount. important. Yes. If you've got dirty equipment and you're or you're trying to ferment with stuff that hasn't been sanitized, you're you're basically inviting bugs to come in and screw up your beer. So, would you say it's particularly important to make sure everything is very sanitary, very clean, uh, even with when you're doing the yeast starter the day before, just make sure that from point A, it's all just super clean. Right, right, absolutely. You, um, what one one distinction is maybe stuff that's not involved with fermentation. So, your mash equipment, your boil equipment, that stuff generally you don't have to sanitize. Just make sure it's nice and clean, I and mean, there's no solid mass particulates, you know, hanging around. Um, but the, everything that's involved with once that wort is cooled in the kettle to fermentation, all that stuff should that comes in contact should be sanitized. Fantastic. So. Yep. So, um, whoa. Whoa. Um, we're kind of like in the middle of um, vorloffing, so it's a little bit. Vorloffing is the process of recirculating wort to get it clear, and I don't know if I can. Maybe if you can help me out, Jameson here. My friend Jameson here, we're both brewing together, doing side-by-side -side brews. And I don't know if you can see that, um, but we've got, we're borloffing here. We're recirculating the wort down through a pump and back up through here. And until, when this is, when this tube here is clear, we know that we're not getting uh, any 
uh, grain coming through, we know that we've got a nice filtration through here, and we'll be ready to start pumping into the kettle. So, but basically, the process of brewing is really simple. Um, it's if you can, we can actually look at Jameson's system here over here. He's doing a brew in a bag, and if this is one way to start out, that's a lot easier. All your grain basically sits in a big mesh bag that's basically like tea. You steep it at a certain temperature, usually around mid 150s, 152, for about an hour. And what he's doing right now is graining into his kettle, which will be very similar to what I'm going to be doing here after I pour it off. They're two slightly different processes, but achieve the same results. And then we uh, will boil for about a we're going to do a 90-minute boil. I know the recipe calls for a 60-minute boil, but we're doing a 90-minute boil to get a little bit more caramelization from that and also a little bit more uh, bitterness. So I'm, I'm kicking my bitter. I've used up a little bit from the 60-some. Shooting for about 100 IBUs. Um, any other questions? What kind of mash did you do? Did you do like a step infusion mash, or I'm sorry, I kind of skipped back a little. But no, it's no, it's that's fine. Um, we did a. We can set this back. Right, watch it. Watch grab it. Pull it over. This is closer. Um, we did a, a single infusion mash, which basically means. Um, sorry, did everyone take your drum with me? <laughs> uh, we did a single infusion mash, which means that you rest at a single temperature point. Um, I did a lower mash at around 148 to get um, to get a little bit of a drier uh, finish. Um, there's a generally speaking, there's a graduated temperature difference. So if you're like in the upper 140s, you're going to get a drier beer. If you're mashing into the lower 150s, generally speaking, you're going to get kind of a moderately medium-bodied beer. And if you're going to mash in the upper 150s, um, you're going to get a heavier mouth feel in the beer. There's going to be a lot more body. And what's going on in that, in those temperature ranges, is we're converting starches to enzymes and, and fermentable sugars. When you're fermenting it or when you're uh, mashing at lower temperatures, you're breaking down those uh, enzymes or those starches into smaller chains and a lot more fermentable. So you're gonna, so like your saisons and uh, uh, some of your other Belgian beers where it's got a really light, crisp finish. Those are gonna be uh, mashed at much lower temperatures so that you get a really dry finish. So your terminal gravity ends up being like 1.008. Um, whereas with some of your heavier beers that have a lot more mouth feel, you're gonna be mashing at the higher temperatures, and then. You're going to get a terminal gravity usually around like 10, 20 or something. Yeah, here's a great example. Jameson is doing doing a gravity reading before his boil, and here there's um, it's going to be impossible to see this on a webcam, but yeah. it's it's coming in around 10:30, and because this is hot, we have to actually take a temperature reading and do a small um, conversion. You have to adjust your gravity reading for how, what the temperature is. So Amazon will take a temperature reading of that and and then we'll convert and figure out what the actual gravity reading is for his beer. So um, did I haven't been checking Twitter. Are there any questions coming in from Twitter yet or Google Plus or Gil, Matthew, have you guys had a moment to look at the Twitter? Or our Google Plus Hangout page. Anybody? Jameson's checking too. Okay. Nothing on the event page. Okay. Well, let me refresh it. I don't know if this is auto refreshing or not. And of course, my daughters are screaming as soon as I unmute. Oh well. <laughs> Deal with it, people. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, nothing on the event page. Let me look in other people, places. Well, maybe I, while, while you're looking, one of the other things I'd like to point out, um, there, there are a few things in brewing that make 
great beer. Um, I mentioned the cleanliness and, and the sanitation. That's key. Also, good water. If your water tastes bad, you probably should go get some larger bottled water from the store or something. Um, some if spring your water, water of sort. Uh, just just regular reverse osmosis water. Um, and then what you do is, but if your water tastes good at home, then you get something that's like it's called Campton tablets, and it helps remove the chlorine out of your water. So if you're brewing all grain, get rid of that chlorine. Um, and one other factor that plays into water is the pH level. So generally speaking, we'll also add um, something like uh, calcium chloride here. Um, there's other additives. There's also a uh, 5-2 pH stabilizer. It basically will help bring the pH down to a level of around between 5-2 and 5-6. If you can get within that range, that helps um, create an ideal scenario for uh, conversions for, from uh, the starches to enzymes and sugars. So how long normally a brewing process like that would last, like in hours, let's say? Well, for, for me, um, from start to finish, including cleanup time, between four and five hours, it really depends upon, you know, sometimes brew day goes well and you three and a half, four hours. Um, sometimes you run into a little snag and you maybe get a stuck sparge and you know you find yourself scrambling to fix something and so it might turn out to be a five hour brew day. And that's just for an average brew day. We've also got other types of processes like uh, there's a decoction mash which is um, done traditionally in German beers. You got the scotch in it? Gotcha. Oh, this is also one uh, delightful part of uh, home brewing. It's called the hot scotchy. Take a splash of scotch and hot wort and mm. a hot scotchy. This Here. is new to me. I think I have to do that tomorrow oh, when I'm this brewing. Is great. So yeah, you, you <laughs> take a little bit of hot wort. It works great for like the heavier, darker beers because there's a lot more character to the malt. This isn't that bad. Yeah. But yeah, that's pretty good. You I think you double <laughs> up my scotch though. So you're both very So I have right? wait. Did I Marcus, were you gonna ask a question? By yeah. the way, welcome Marcus. We're happy Hi. you're here. Hi, this is Marcus Penn. He is one of our Craft Beer Nation moderators. We're super excited to have him here. He's actually going to be taking over for me a little bit later when I have to head out to work. Um, and did you have a question for Michael? I did have a question for Michael. You're both brewing Sippa, right? You're just doing yes. like an all grain, and he's doing Sippa uh, brew in a bag. <laughs> yep, which yeah. is also all grain. It's yeah. just different methodology. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be pretty. Uh, that's pretty awesome. I'm gonna be. I like to. I, would, I wouldn't mind having them like side by side to see if they, you know, come out with with a little bit of different variances in them, or if they come out pretty much the same. That'd be really. That'd be really awesome to have. We've actually got slightly different. We're taking both slightly different um, ingredients too. I'm kind of going more English with mine. Okay. I'm using a British ale yeast from fermentation, and um, I'm also using British pale malt. Jameson's and, using American stuff. Yeah, I'm using a, a RAR pale malt, which is from down here in Minnesota. Uh, I'm using 1056 American yeast ale. And I also... Um, oh, too much scotch for you there, buddy? Woo! <laughs> um, I also <laughs> ran into a problem that a lot of the other brewer, breweries have talked about. I was not able to find one of the particular hops for the recipe. Um, there just simply was no supply here in town for it, and so I had to substitute in a slightly different hop. Michael was lucky enough. He had some of the uh, this particular hop left over. So I'm a hoarder. Yeah. <laughs> he ended up being able. He's brewing exactly with the same hops in the recipe. I had to make one substitution. So actually, I do have one exception. I'm throwing in a hop shot yeah, at the so 90 minute mark. Yes, so yes. I'm kicking it up 50 IBUs. And so you might want to explain what a hop shot actually is. Hop shot yes. is good. Good point. Hop shot is actually <laughs> um, concentrated um, alpha acids. So it's you don't get a lot of the astringency and the vegetal matter um, that you would from hops. This is they actually extract the the bittering components of the hop. Um, you generally using CO2 method, uh, a CO2 extraction, and so this is this is straight up bittering. 
So you throw that, you know, squirt it in the beginning of the boil, and boom, and you actually save yourself, um, you know, uh, having to have all that, you know, hot mass, you know, at the, from the very beginning. Because well, I was on kid duty stuff this morning, if someone could clue me in, which hop variety was difficult for, for folks to get? Uh, Amarillo. Really? Yeah, uh, around here we have we have none of them at our. Uh, our I place have had to order online. Is yeah. is that is there a shortage of Amarillo right now, or is that the, just uh, the, high demand? Uh, yeah, it's high demand, high demand, and I don't believe the harvest this year is in yet. So. Well, no, the it was a. The the harvest was collect you know obviously collected late fall early winter yeah so then you've got basically that duration you've got a whole year to get yeah, around yeah we're drawing to towards the yeah. end of the supply okay I got gotcha. you because amarillo's in high demand you know it's basically um, they'll segment out to the different distributors or different homebrew supply stores and say all right here's your allotment that's what you get. This talk, talk about, about yeah, talk about the, the the conversion chart. How accurate those conversion, like you know, those charts that tells you don't have that, use that. They're not reliable. It, it's 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 kind of like ballpark. Like, all right, this might be a similar flavor, but honestly, it's um, it's just a guide. You know, it's you're not going to necessarily get the same flavors because you know every hop is unique. So you're going to get maybe some similar properties, but um, what you're really interested in is is you know are the IBUs and uh, going to be similar, um, and are the flavor properties going to be in the same neighborhood? But you know, once you start subbing out hops, like if you're subbing out Cascade or Centennial. Instead of Amarillo, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get different flavors. But, you know, that's the fun of it. You know, you make it a different beer every time. So, but that's the challenge that commercial brewers have is is you know sourcing those same hops. You know, throughout the brewing year. You know. I'll water you down. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, I don't need a Scotch buzz at eleven in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, do you have any uh, DM? Um, so, have we, Gil, have you checked any of our feeds? Do we have any new questions? Let me refresh our Twitter feed and see what is going yeah, on. I'm, trying, I'm checking on, uh, on the unit uh, now. I'll let you know. I am Twitter incompetent, and I don't even know how to check our Twitter feed for questions, to be perfectly <laughs> honest. <laughs> but uh, I think I have a sort of legitimate question for you. Um, when it comes to home brewing, and we have you have all those little kits that you can buy, and I think some yeah. people are just less intimidated by buying uh, a home brewing kit, maybe to do it for their first time. Could you give them Absolutely. advice on how to maybe make that a better experience or turn out to be a better beer? A lot of people say, like, oh, when you brew something from a kit, you can taste it, and you know it came from a kit, uh, namely because of the malt extract and, and other things. But I know that a lot of places will say, like, oh, we'll switch out the yeast and, and use, a, a, use a different yeast or put your own twist on the hops and doing things like that. Do you have a, a special way to kind of maybe – help someone who wants to brew from a kit for the first time, just to get a grasp on the process, um, make it's that beer a little more interesting. Oh, this is... oh, yeah, that's... Sorry, we're, we're in the middle of... Yeah, me, sorry, we're in the middle of a... Uh... All right, okay. Um, we're good now. We're good. I, I, I timed my brew really poorly, so I'm in, like, the middle of the most busiest part here in word collection. Um, but extract kits are the way one of, one of two ways to get started. It's probably the easiest way and I would equate it to cake box mixes. Um, you can buy some good cake box mix, you know, and come out with a good product in the end. You know, there are good mixes and there are bad mixes. Uh, in the same way with uh, the beer kits, you can get good beer kits and you can get bad beer kits bad beer kits. 
Um, with extract, the biggest thing is the freshness of the extract. So if you're buying from, say, a homebrew store that doesn't turn around a lot of product, maybe they're not as busy, you probably don't want to get your extract from there. But if you're ordering from some place that probably has a lot of uh, turnaround in terms of products like Northern Brewer or Austin Homebrew Supply or some of the other big chains, more, more beer is another good example, um, you're more likely to have fresh extract. So if you, have the, if you have fresh extract, you're going to probably have better tasting beer in the end. And you can you can make award homebrew competition award winning you know extract beers you know people people have done it you can make really good tasting beer um, but one of the things that I think that new homebrewers kind of overlook is the importance of cleanliness and sanitation um, also healthy yeast um, that's a really big thing so like if you're if you're not comfortable with yeast starters, buy a second pack of yeast. You know, so like if you're brewing a big imperial stout or a big IPA, buy that second um, pack of yeast or that second vial of yeast, so that you're starting out with a healthy uh, population of yeast before you actually begin fermentation. Uh, otherwise, what happens is you get stressed yeast. And yes, yeast do get stressed. There's a lot of things that are going on. If they're too stressed, then you're going to start getting weird off flavors or byproducts in your beer in the end. And then it starts to taste like homebrew. You know, that homebrew that, oh, here, try this. Uh, okay. Oh, interesting. You know, you get that kind of whole thing going on. So healthy yeast is really important. Um, I, I'm a big fanboy of white yeast and white labs is good too I've used I've used them on a number of occasions but I'm really big on white yeast so the dry yeast is, is good too I've used it before but I've not been as happy with the results personally but awesome. one other thing. we have another oh what one oh, more go ahead. I yeah. was just going to welcome Randy to the panel and see if he had any questions for us as well. We're in our home brewing portion right now. Um, no, not 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 at the at the specific moment. I wasn't able to watch live because the the kids weren't allowing me to watch live, so I'm not sure what's all been covered. So, just give me a a, a few minutes. I'll I'll come up. With all some, right, we'll with let some, you absorb some more information first. Yeah. But welcome to the Big Sipper. We are glad you're here. Thank you. It's the yeah. Big Sipper. <laughs> yes. Marcus is really excited. Marcus is being even more excited when I can drink a beer. Yeah. Well, it's 12 o'clock, right? I just have to wait for the wife to get back to take the younger two off my hands. I'm on, I'm on kid duty-ish right now. We've had a few little kids pop in today for the Big Sipa. And, you know, I think that's one of those fun things about homebrewing is to an extent... When the kids are old enough, you can have them around, assuming that they've learned all of the safety practices and, and they know what to touch and what not to touch. Yeah, I'm sure but, yeah. my daughter will be making a cameo before this is said and done. So. Yeah, my boy's already come on and, and given his big wave. And there's Emmy for you. There's Emmy. Emmy says hello. That's, we have lots of little, my, little young homebrewers on Craft Beer Nation. Yeah. So, Michael, what stage in the process are you in right now? Um, right now, I'm in sparging, and let's see if I can do this, show you this without um, totally destroying everything. Um, right now, I've got a small sparge arm, and this is what um, this is a just obviously it's just a cooler, but it doubles as a hot liquor tank. Hot liquor tank is uh, where you store your hot water not, and not liquor. Um, yeah, ten gallons of liquor that would be something, uh, but it's. Just uh, rinsing the grain with uh, water that's at about 168 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, and uh, in Celsius that would be just under 80 Celsius. And what you, what I'm doing is I'm slowly collecting the wort out of the mash tun, 
and at the same time rinsing the grain to try and extract as much of the fermentable sugars and, and whatnot that came out of that's that's still in the grain. And what that does is that actually gives you a higher extraction efficiency. So I'm usually averaging around 85 to 90 percent extraction efficiency, which is I think is pretty good. And then we'll collect off into the boil kettle and begin that in short order. So that's where I'm in the process. So you, you are you you're collecting your wort like right below your yep, your sparging uh, pot. Yep, the wort I'm collecting right below here uh, okay. into this kettle. I'm using a pump. I used a pump for uh, recirculation to do my vorloffing. Vorloffing is the process of um, establishing the grain bed, so it acts as a natural filter. Okay. So that so that all that comes out is wort, and I'm not actually extracting grain. Okay. Now, by contrast, Jameson's setup. He's doing brew in a bag, and I don't know if you can see the orange. Uh, the cooler off to the side here. That's got a big sack in it. You tilt, tilt your camera grain. forward a little bit. Okay. That, so yeah. in okay. there, he's got basically grain, and this is basically like one big tea bag. Yeah. And yeah, I said tea bag. <laughs> <Here>. <laughs> and then, uh, then, then we uh, did the word collection into his kettle. So, in a in a sense, um, brewing a bag is. Um, a great way. This is segments back into Terra, which you were saying about uh, or asking about home brewers just getting into the hobby for the first time. Extract kits are great, but if you're a little bit more adventurous and want to uh, get into the source of how things are made, um, you can try brewing a bag where you're actually steeping the grain, and then you're 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 becoming more intimately acquainted with how that extract was made. This, the wort that's coming out, that the uh, professional or commercial uh, extract producers, they will actually create massive quantities of wort, remove as much of the water as they can, and that is your extract. So what uh -huh. we're basically doing in the process of mashing is we are creating an extract level that's appropriate for our beer. So. Okay, so the, so they kind of the extract is basically um, concentrated. Work? Concentrated work. Okay. Yep. The nice thing about doing brew in a bag, if you're just starting out, is that you can you have more control over the type of ingredients that you're adding. So with extract, with malt extract, you're limited in the type of extracts that you can use. Whereas with brew in a bag, you can or Traditional all grain brewing, you can uh, you can source the types of different um, malt that you want to go into your beer, and okay. have a, a wider array of options. Um, and one thing I would suggest uh, for home brewers that may want to entertain the idea of starting brewing a bag, um, it's okay to be adventurous and you know try and come up with your own recipes, but I highly suggest picking up like a book. Um, there's a couple different beers or beer brewing books like there's um, Brewing Classic Styles from J Jamil Zanishev. There's also, um, uh, what's that Ray Daniels book? Uh, oh, Designing Great Beers. Um, use something that's established and has a little bit of solid reputation for building your own recipes. So use the guides in their books as opposed to just blindly trusting the interwebs. Because we know how reliable the interwebs can be. So. All right. Thank you so much. I want to. I want to ask one more question. Okay. One more question, and then we're going to head over to Boris. One more. One more. All right. So if someone is going to get in, into homebrew, has never really done it before, would it be better for them to go extract or start with brew in a bag? It depends upon their adventure level. Um, and you're gonna, uh, look, at, look at Brains. He's uh, putting his hops in now. He is. It's very exciting. I don't know if anyone caught uh, their little cam going on, but we got to see them getting the uh, the spent grain out, and now they're adding the hops to the wort. All good stuff. Locking it down. But um, it's the, the nice thing about brewing a bag. There's a low equipment investment. So you really don't need a lot of, but you just need a big kettle and maybe a cooler, and a few other things. But it depends upon your level of adventure. If you're more adventurous and you want to 
you want to learn like learn how to bake cake from scratch or bake bread from scratch, then you might be more interested in starting out brewing a bag. Otherwise, if you if you have a low threshold of commitment or you're just kind of tinkering with it, then then try some of the one or two gallon extract kits. My my opinion is extract, but, but when I started out, I found that extract learning the process, all the different steps. If you if you don't, I mean, if you cook a lot, maybe you're more used to you know following a bunch of recipes and that kind of stuff. But I found extract was much easier having to leave yeah. some stuff out. Yep. So, um, if if there's more questions that come along the way, um, hashtag the big sippa and we'll post answers um, on the event page itself. So. And Michael will be here in the hangout for a good bit of the day too, so we can yep. we can touch back with him if we have to. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. We really appreciate all of your advice and helping hey. us. My privilege. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. And we are going to head over to Boris now. Hello, Boris. How are you? Hey, you guys. It's a little loud, so uh, hope you don't mind. But, uh, no, I got that's Max. fine. I got Max with us from, uh, from the Spotlight. <laughs> awesome. Welcome. We're going to have Santa Fe Brewing on here today. I think I missed it when it was a spotlight, didn't I? And I was really sad because some people were drinking this coffee one. There was a coffee beer that I wanted so badly and I did not get. That's the job it's out. Yeah. That I was that is amazing too. I think we should go off the side. Awesome. I think we have some funky things going on with audio. Is that just me? I'm trying to I'm trying to mute myself at the right time so you guys aren't bombarded by the brewery's activities. So if I if it's if you hear a little bit of weird stuff, it might be me just muting me or us, letting you talk, unmuting me, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay, that's totally fine. Well what part of the process are you what system are you using also? Uh, well for the big zip up we're using their small batch system. It's a 10 gallon setup. You have your, let me get out of the way so you guys can see. You got your three components. The one on the right is the hot liquor where it holds just hot water. The one in the middle is the mash ton where the mash, where the grain is sitting at right now. And on the left is the brew kettle where the boil will, will go down. Awesome, exciting. And at what part of the brewing process are you guys at? Right now, I'm heating up the sparge water, and it's almost there, actually. And then I will be sparging that mash for the next hour to get it to get it nice and nice and clear, and then throw it into the kettle and start boiling away. Fantastic. So, Boris, they're letting you brew things. I know. Do they make you sign a waiver? Uh, no, we we trusted him. We knew uh, that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, Gil, uh, Marcus, anybody? Do we have any questions? Hey, Boris, can you? I'm sorry. Can Can you say again what the three different kettles were? Is it, I mean, it, I'm assuming it's the same thing as the same concept as as a micro setup. So, so uh, 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 it is uh, pretty much. Uh, I believe Michael is. Homebrew setup, he's got his gravity fed three tier. So it's, it's, instead of this, this isn't gravity fed, this is pumps. There's, I don't know if you can see it, let me tilt it down right there, right here. Right here are two pumps. If we circulate and shove hot water, the, uh, the runoff from the mash and pumps it into the boil kettle. So there's no. So it's basically your hot water tank, then your sparge, and then you're collecting your wort, right? Yes. The okay. the middle the middle one is the uh, where the mash is at right now, and it's got a sparge set up on top, a splice sparge. So from the hot liquor tank, you're gonna take your sparge water and then feed it to the top of the grain, the bed, and which is what uh, Duskin's doing right now, and it'll sparge, and, uh, excuse me, 
run that hot water through the drain, and the pump will start to feed it into the boil kettle from the runoff. Like when it's nice and not clear, clear, but free of grain. You, know, you get what I'm saying? Husks and stuff? Yeah. Awesome. Gil and Matthew, do you guys have any questions for Boris? Yeah. Uh, well, our tasting room is uh, a tasting room, so we're trying to keep muted here, so uh, to not interfere too much. But uh, uh, no, I, I, and I stepped away. So what, what's Gil doing? No, I was just, uh, I was just wondering, uh, uh, how is that going to work? Like the, the process and everything. Can you talk about uh, the beer and how you guys are approaching making this IPA? Um, I mean, how 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 tight are you holding to the recipe? Are there are there uh, alterations that you had to make based on grain availability or hop availability? No, it is exactly what we got in the, exactly what we got out there um, on the web for everyone to brew. It's uh, what do I got? Like 20, 20 something pounds of two row and a quarter three quarters pound of twenty three pounds of two row. And three quarters pound of Crystal 80, and then all the hops that were uh, that were discussed: five hops, Centennial, Summit, Simcoe, Columbus, and Amarillo. With uh, with the American Ale yeast, the uh, the yeast, the Y yeast 1056. Awesome. So you guys were uh, able to get all of the materials pretty easily. Yeah. The uh, the, the incredible thing about the small batch system is. We use the the grain and the hops and the yeast, if available, that the brewery has. So uh, let me see if I can aim my webcam. Uh, where am I? All right, behind this big silver, I think that's the ladder ton, is their, where they store their grain, all the specialty and also the base grain. And all uh, Duskin did was go over there and grab 23 pounds. Uh, two row and three quarters pound of carry eighty, and we, we build it right here. Awesome. Yeah, it's this this whole small batch thing that they do every other Saturday or every Saturday. It's uh, it's pretty awesome. The the home brewer, whether they be novice or on a almost pro level, you can come here, brew ten gallons of it. Five gallon stays here at the brewery. Five gallon goes to their second location in uh, Santa Fe and El Dorado, and uh, it gets served right on tap. And they have a little board that has small batch Saturday, and then they put the beer that's on tap. So in about in about a month from now, uh, the board will read hashtag the big simple. So when anybody comes in and tries it, they know that they're doing they're drinking what we're making today, what the world is making today. So Boris, do you have any plans for your for your spent grain? Are y'all just gonna toss it or what? Uh, personally, you know, I don't. You know, have you know, have you know, have you know, uh, right now, I don't have plans. Um, I don't. Uh, I believe they uh, recycle their spent grain here, so they'll probably just recycle it just like they do any other any other uh, batch that they do in house. But I. May be brewing this big sip of tomorrow at home as my first all grain batch on my home system. And personally, I have probably a lot of pizza to make with almost 12 pounds of grain. Nice. <laughs> and uh, let, me, let me introduce uh, Gabe, one of their brewers. He's right here. Hey, guys. Hey, how are you? Good, you? Good, thank you. Thanks so much for participating today in the day today, Bob. We really appreciate it. Uh, I think that, uh, Boris uh, was muted, but it's a little bit from our mic. Yeah, it's, I have the speakers literally right here next to the webcam, um, so I can hear you guys talk. Um, so, I'm trying to mute, like I said, in the appropriate time. You'll need to just move the speakers away from the webcam. You can keep them close, but move them. I don't have room. Yeah, in a different yeah, direction. And make sure they are sitting. Here, let me move them back. Yeah, yeah. Try behind the webcam because it's, it's. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Is that a little better? 
That is that much better. They told me they told the horse that we're going to use our we're going to use our home roof system, but um, your your office is going to be up there. Your bucket turned upside down. So he can't even have any space. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Gabe, you want to tell them what you're doing today? Uh, we're working on the Oktoberfest right now, getting it ready for our, uh, our fall release. Uh, it's our second batch of it that we're running off right now, and uh, we'll for that for, for a week or so, and then we'll get it, we'll get it lagering and get it ready for August. Nice. So are you guys just doing a traditional Oktoberfest? Yeah, we do uh, we do traditional German style. We have uh, a proprietary yeast that we have that came up over from Germany. We use it for our Oktoberfest and our uh, Pilsner. And uh, a lot of Munich malts and Pilsner. It's, uh, it's a really nice, rich entry into the fall. So, so how do you guys look into the, put your, um, your um, put that beer out the Oktoberfest? We're moving up our release dates on our seasonals. Uh, we're trying to have them out the Oktoberfest in particular. We're trying to get out in August, early in August, so that uh, we can have it out and people can can be tasting it and thinking about it as we enter into the fall. We're just trying to get out ahead of the curve a little bit. Awesome. I have noticed that a lot in some craft breweries. I know that we've got Southern Pumpkin Southern already came out this week, in my region at least, and I just thought that was insane. It's July and it's so hot. I don't know why there's pumpkin beers out right now. Not that I'm a stickler to like styles having to be drank at certain times of year, but I mean, there's a little tradition to it, and I just don't feel like having a pumpkin beer in July. Yeah. I don't, I'm not even trying to think of a pumpkin beer in July. Yeah. But, you know, we found that a couple months ahead of time, the uh, magazines and the websites start asking for oh, yeah. people so that, you know, so that they can review it and they can get some timely information out. Or, you know, when it's well, Oktoberfest is traditionally drink in September, isn't it? So coming out with it in August isn't that bad. I mean, that's still within this time frame of when the style is being drank appropriately, I guess you could say. So that I can see, but pumpkin and July. <laughs> I I Tara, I agree with you one hundred percent. Like it's I mean, it's too hot outside. <laughs> To even want something with you know with all with the because I mean pumpkin beers typically have a lot of complexity to them and like when it's hot outside I mean there's a reason why people want you know pilsners and lagers in the summertime because they're easy they're they're, they're simple it, you know it's, it quenches your thirst almost but a pumpkin beer you know just has way too much too much complexity going on for, to to be enjoyed in the summertime in in my opinion yeah. Boris, you're muted. No way. Is that your DM? This, this is our Oktoberfest, yeah. This That's, a kick -ass kick -ass That's a kick-ass kick -ass kick -ass But it, I would even say, and I would even say that August is a little early for me to be drinking it. But by the time September rolls around, you know, it'll be out there, and people will be hearing about it, and and then it'll yeah. be time. And it, when it's time, it'll already be out. Speaking of that, I, uh, I have to get back to it. I'm in the middle of brewing right now. Awesome. Thank you for sitting down to chat with us. Rock Thank on. You Thanks a lot, you Cheers. guys. Cheers, man. Cheers. 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 Awesome. So, so, Boris, I know um, that's a that's a five get that. That's a five-gallon system behind you, right? No, that's a ten-gallon system. Oh, okay. There's a question from Alan. Hold on, let me go grab it. So you gonna uh, yield? We may need to run this one back over to the to the Santa Fe Brewers. And Boris, you can play Aaron Aaron Boy with this question. And bring one of them back over. Uh, as he's asking, uh, a lot of breweries release early because of you know ease of production. You know, do they have a reason or just because? And I think the 
the big reason that they were saying they were going to release this Oktoberfest in kind of late August uh, was, you know, by the time, like, Oktoberfest drinking season, you know, rolls around mid, mid, in, mid of end September, the beer's out where it needs to be so people can get it. And other folks have, you know, had a chance to taste it. And... Thank you for your opinion, baby girl. She uh, thinks it's too early. Yeah, she thinks it's too early. Miss um, Emmy. Yeah, say, it is too early. Uh, Hi, so, Emmy. So those that, uh, that do want to drink it, you know, have had it, and then they can talk about it and get other folks drinking it. You know, I, th- I'm, I can totally understand why these breweries are releasing some of their seasonals a few, a few weeks to maybe a month or two early. You know, I mean, if they're not a well-known beer, a well, uh, not a well-known brand, then it may take a couple of weeks or months of, of word of mouth to get around for people to actually know that, hey, this is a great seasonal beer. You should definitely go pick it up. You know, there's nothing worse than hearing, you know, in November that, hey, the, these these guys had a great Oktoberfest. Did you have it? And you're like, well, no. Yeah, but Marcus, in, in this example, like when you're thinking about pumpkin. I mean, it's pretty well known pumpkin beer. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Tara and Randy on any pumpkin beer released in July. I'm sorry, that's just I don't know two months early, but that's just my opinion. Uh, now for Santa Fe's Oktoberfest, Max, to uh, take care of that. Answer. It's yeah, it's it's mostly just we want to get it out early so that um, people can do reviews of it. We can get it out to our distributor. We're distributing in eight states right now, and so we want to make sure that the people who you know get to hear about our Oktoberfest can find it in those respective states and um, be able to enjoy it at, at the right time. Yeah, I mean, it also gives you guys the, the leeway to brew more if you need it because you came out with it a little bit earlier. There's that time that if you need some more quantity, um, if you made more, it would be able to come out in the proper time. And then also, um, the the word of mouth, it does do a lot. So when you have it coming out then, it does, uh, it has a lot of benefits. And I do, I mean, that's very common now. We're seeing a lot of craft breweries coming out with these seasonal styles or specialties uh, just a tad bit earlier than we would have expected them to. And it does make sense when you have things like the Craft Beer Nation and the Blogosphere and the Beer Advocate and all these magazines who are going to be putting out reviews and they do need to taste that beforehand. Because obviously we want them to be putting out a good, honest review of a beer that they tasted, not just maybe what they remembered of it last year going, oh, hey, they make this style also. Yeah. So I see yeah. the reason for doing it early. I just, uh, and and I don't think that you guys are doing that early. That seems quite appropriate to me, actually. I just think with some things, we see a lot of people kind of pushing pushing the limit a little with how they're coming out with it, and it kind of seems to me it's more of a, oh, we put this one out first, so everyone's going to be drinking this one this season. And I don't, uh, I think that's a little just kind of funny, but. Yeah, I, I agree, because in my opinion, Oktoberfest is kind of like a, like a September October beer, so coming out in August is like the the perfect time, yeah. the perfect time for that. Whereas whereas a pumpkin beer is <laughs> like Halloween, you know what I mean? That's that's like a you know. right, right. And I honestly, you know, it, it takes with shipping our beers on trucks yeah. and things like that. If we're going, I mean, we border with Texas, but it's such a large state, you know, it can take a long time to to get there, and so. Uh, it's just, yeah, it's just in an effort to, to get people their beer maybe a little bit early. It might sit in our warehouse for a little bit after it's canned. Um, but usually, once things are in cans here or bottles, they, they go out pretty quickly. So. Awesome. Do we have any more questions from Randy, from Gil and Matthew? I know you guys are trying to be quiet because you're sitting in the tasting room over there. But do you have anything to chime in with? Yes, I, I wasn't away. Did, did you guys, did you guys in, in talk about your uh, flagship beers yet? So people are aware what you're doing right now and your projects, what you're coming up with. No, we have a few. Uh, we have a few beers that that we're definitely known for. One of them is this Happy Camper IPA. Uh, just the can, do- can design alone sells a lot of people on it, but then you find out that it's a really well balanced incredible IPA in the can and uh, so that helps a lot 
the Happy Camper we've been brewing since about 2010, and it's almost 30% of our sales right now. So, um, another, our Santa Fe Pale Ale is an old recipe. We've been doing that one for a long time, as well as our porter is pretty well known. Um, and then we have our seasonals that change a lot. Um, just last year, or the year before last year, we started our Java Stout, our Imperial Java Stout, and it started as a winter seasonal. And the, it, it was received so well that immediately after that winter season, we just started brewing it year-round, and, and now we distribute, distribute it year-round. Um, and I think that's probably going to happen with our Black IPA, too, with our previous... Uh, that was our previous winter seasonal. And that's a really big beer. It's it's really well balanced and quite roasty. It's a that's a great one if you guys have tried it yet. Uh, we're, uh, we're gonna have, I think Randy had some. Uh, I sent you guys somebody the lucky few you got the black eyed days. I can't remember if I sent it to you that spotlight we have that. I had, I think you sent me one in, I know you sent me the Happy Camper, which was delicious. I think I sent but you the Irish you Red. Sent me the Irish Red? I'm going to drop the black. Okay. The Irish Red, was it in a red yes, can? Yes, it was the red can, yeah. The Irish Red, and that was yeah. delicious. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't know that their black IPA was seasonal. So when we set up the spotlight, and I had to, and I sent you guys a beer. Like I sent all of it out, so everyone, everyone can have it. So uh, I plan on getting an insane amount of black IPA this coming winter. <laughs> awesome. Let's see. Who do we have available for questions right now? Gil, Matthew, Marcus. We have so many breweries, which is super cool. Seeing all these people hey, brewing their beer. So Boris over there right now uh, at Santa Fe Brewing, are they giving tours? Is that why people are kind of walking around? Or right now, actually, uh, I was getting ready to say the caller gentleman is uh, our very own community member, Nick. Uh, he's here. Hello, Nick. <laughs> he, uh, how are you doing? He shows Good. Up. How are you? <laughs> He shows up a lot on their small batch Saturdays to get acclimated with the machine. I think he's already you brewed on here already, right? I brewed it already. Yeah. So he's already brewed on the system too. So uh, uh, no, right now they're uh, they're I don't even think they're open for business day. I think 11 a.m. my time, which is in about 20 minutes, is when they open. So, but they will they do do tours on Saturdays. Yeah, so we'll, we'll have a tour we'll have a tour at about noon every Saturday. Awesome. I think that's so fantastic that you guys have these craft beer lovers coming out there and brewing on your small batch system. That's really unique. I know that some breweries uh, kind of have similar uh, practices, but uh, I don't see them doing it kind of how you guys are. It seems like you're pretty open to have people come and hang out and brew and really experience what the process is all about. I think that's phenomenal. Absolutely, and uh, we definitely, I mean, we love our home brewers here and, and just getting people excited about what we're doing. Right here, this is the black IPA can uh, that, I mean, like I said, the can design is great, and then what's inside the can is also pretty amazing. Um, but our home brewers, we, we really respect our home brewers, and they're definitely part of what we do here. Um, for example, around Christmas time, so right around the end of November, we will start brewing the 12 beers of Christmas, and so uh, we'll have 12 different home brewers make a beer, a Christmas beer or whatever style they really want. It's totally up to them. And then uh, 12 days before Christmas, we will start the first one on rotation on tap in our tap room. And That's then awesome. every, every day after that, we'll have a new one. Last year there was a, a chocolate red chili stout that was just amazing, that and uh, yeah, a lot of creativity. All these beers are, are different. We also had like a, a 
yeah, we had some, uh, we had a, a pine, oh, what was it for the, it, some, one of our brewers made a, made a beer and he substituted hops with, um, pino, no, not pine nuts, but juniper berries, juniper berries. And that was a very interesting beer. It was a little sweet for my liking, but, um, you know, any, anything is, anything's game for 12 Beers of Christmas. That's really amazing. That sounds like so cool. I wish a brewery around here did that. <laughs> so, uh, other than your uh, collab, I would call with your home brewer that you guys do, you do a lot of uh, just like one batch or test batch, just, you know, once in a while, just to get something different to do. We, we do do that sometimes. Um, so Gabe, our brewer, one of our brewers we were just talking with, um, he developed the recipe for our Saison, for Saison 88 that um, just came out. And we're going to be brewing that until December. But we knew it was going to be a production beer. However, Gabe made, I think, 10 different versions of it before we decided, decided on a correct yeast and pop combination. Um, so we, we do make little things, um, you know, when we're thinking of prospective beers for the future. And that's just, it's, I love it because any employee can come in on a Saturday or any, you know, over from anywhere can come in on a Saturday and do what they want and uh, it's experiment. Marcus, do you have any questions? Um, I don't have any specific questions other other than uh, ooh thunder. Hopefully, I don't lose internet and or power. Uh, it just started pouring down rain in the last about twenty minutes or so. Uh, so with with Santa Fe, uh, have y'all ever taken like a like a recipe that's kind of started on your small batch system? improved upon it and then made it like one of your releases outside of the tap room and if not I think you should have a contest and do it. Well actually we are going to be having a contest with our distributors in Kansas City so they they're actually going to send some homebrewers out I forget exactly how they figured out who's going to brew um, but we're going to do that and then that beer that they brew on our system will then be released only to Kansas City. And it's going to be, yeah, nowhere else. We're not even going to have it here in our capital. And so we, we have done that competition. And um, what I can do is I can I can send you the link to um, the Twitter feed from that stuff and let you know a little bit more of how that process is going. I actually need to check up on it, too. So we're just kind of starting to get into that. Typically, when a home brewer makes their beer, we just put it on, on tap, and I mean, there, there have been some amazing, amazing recipes to come out of that program. Um, there are a lot of people who come here every Saturday just to taste the new small batch, because it changes every week. So give us an update on what's going on behind y'all with, uh, with the small batch. What's, what's going on now? Uh, right now, I think <laughs> they are, uh, they're, they're still uh, sparging, so they're taking the hot water from this tank, putting it into the middle tank that's right in front of Nick, and the mash is settling through and running through the grain, which is pulling the wart, which is then getting transferred to the very last keg on the left. Uh, that's actually the brew kettle, and once we get to the 10-gallon line, then we shut off everything to the right, take on the flames on the on the brew kettle, and we get the, the boil going, so then we can start dropping hops and making the rest of what is known as beer. So so Boris, I'm guessing that like the sparging process, like right now what's going on is water is continually coming from your hot water tank and going over your over your um your your um your grain, right? So yes. I'm yes. assuming that Doing it on a continual basis like that is a lot more efficient than just saying, you know, you get your grain like in a big strainer and just pour hot water on it and boom, there's your wart. 
It's much more efficient. You get more sugars when you do it the way that you're doing it right now, slowly. Yeah, um, the method that you're referring to where you just you have it sitting over a strainer and you pour the sparge water over it and then let it trickle, um, it, is more, it is more efficient and it's also less strain on the brewer, even the home brewer, uh, because you're not consistently pouring a quart of 170 degree water for an hour. So um, with the pumps, like this system has, you can just continuously feed it over. And what you want to do is you want to keep about that much water above the grain bed all the way down until you collect your 10 gallon boil or 11 and a half gallon, whatever it may be, uh, to boil. So, so you don't, you don't, you know, you get the fish you see that you need. You pull the the nice clean wort almost. It's gonna be a little cloudy, but it's not gonna be full of full of uh, husks or chunks of grain. So this the, the spar setup, the fly spar setup is can be more efficient on a lot of levels. Um, there are home brewers that do batch spars, and I, 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 I'm not sure if Michael touched upon that when uh, he talked about his segment. But basically, you take your you're you're using the the water in the whole mass ton. And, uh, or the whole batch. So for this example, it'd be a 10 gallon batch. You're gonna have a certain amount of water designated for batch sparging that you're gonna put on the grain and just slowly feed it through to clean out all the sugars. You're not fly sparging where you're just consistently feeding hot water. And hi the <laughs> For Randy's got a little one on his shoulder there. I was I, I, I was know. able to so I was able to hand my little one there. off. <laughs> now I have beer. Life is good. Oh, exciting! Nice trade off. I and had, a I nice glass too, Marcus. One. Are you drinking out of your Craft Beer Nation glass? I have to say, I'm really Craft jealous. I have not received my glass yet. I think, oh. I think I think Boris ended up with both of my both of our glasses. So I have <laughs> my, 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 Michael, I don't have my glass either. So right. we're, we're the same actually, boat. We're in the same boat. Actually, I, I think, received I think, mine just in time. I think Lee made up those tracking numbers. You know, the first time I searched mine, it said it didn't exist, and then the next time I searched it, it said it was delivered, and I looked on my doorstep, and there it was. <laughs> it was very exciting. But yeah, I have mine. We have our fancy new Craft Beer Nation glasses, thanks to one of our favorite moderators, Lee Allison, um, who normally hosts our Friday night hangouts and will be here later today. Um, we have a lot of exciting things coming up. This has only really been the first portion of our day, and we do have to take a short break because there is a hangout limit on Google+. Plus. Um, so we'll be rebuilding the Hangout and doing the Big Sip Up Part 2 where we'll have some more people joining us such as Nicole Ernie, a master Cicerone from the Cicerone Certification Program. I'm really excited about that and might not be able to stick around because I do have to go to work. Um, also, our favorite app ever, or maybe it's my favorite app ever, I can't speak for everyone, but Untapped, one of the co-founders, Greg Avila, will be stopping by and chatting with us briefly about Untapped, uh, what we can expect from this fantastic app that all of us craft beer drinkers have seemed to embrace significantly. Um, we will have Miss Ashley Bauer driving all the way down to, is it Noda? Is that how you say it? Is it Noda Brewing? Yeah, Anybody? Noda. Okay, Noda Brewing. Um, we'll finally be able to hear from Matthew and uh, Matthew and Gill over at James River Brewing and Shenandoah Valley. They're doing a collaboration for the Big Step Up. Uh, we have a cooking demo. Breckenridge is coming on. Uh, a lot of exciting things for the rest of the day here at the Big Step Up. So we hope that you've learned something about home brewing, enjoyed uh, all of our visitors from the UK. We still have Simon Martin over there. They're working hard. You could see them Nothing out earlier. Uh, we also have Masters Brewing still on. Hey, there they are with their thumbs up. 
So Do you want to give us an great. update on what's going on with their brew real quick? Or can yeah, they talk? I would I would love to hear some updates from the other breweries who are still here. I guess, uh, Masters, can you tell us what's going on in your brew house right now? Hi. Um, we're just waiting to come on the boil now and add our first hop. So we're just waiting. <laughs> Fantastic. That's, it seems like there is some waiting and brewing, some patience and consistency there. It's all right, we've got a few pints we can have in between. Yes, from your <laughs> beautiful, beautiful pub that we got to see earlier. Yeah, we've got customers in the pub now. Awesome, are they wondering why you're cuddled around the laptop back in the <laughs> pub? <laughs> yeah, they're all looking at us strangely now. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And I over love, at Brain... Oh, yes, Marcus. I um, absolutely oh, love yeah. your wood panel equipment back there. That is yes. gorgeous. We went over that again and again and again earlier. <laughs> Everyone to to loves it. Because that is, that is simply beautiful. Could you actually tell us again who made that, just since we have that focus on you right now, uh, uh, who, who made that little brew system back there for you? Uh, it's a company uh, close to us called SW Fabrications, and uh, they do have a website, and it's uh, breweriesforsale.co.uk. <laughs> awesome. So if anyone else is coveting this brew system uh, right there, that is where you find them. I know I'll be checking out the website later. Brewery for sale or breweries? Breweries in the plural. Okay, breweriesforsale.co.uk? .co.uk. Awesome. So if you covet that system as much as everybody else on the panel right now, that is where you can find it and ones like it. What's the um, size of those systems, if I could? What 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 sizes do you offer again? I missed that part when I was brewing. Uh, there's a two and a half barrel. There's one barrel, and he's considering a five at the moment. Ooh, a five. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Check I think we're gonna hop over to to uh, Simon real quick, also if he can hear us, if he's listening. Hello, Simon. Hello. How's it going? Oh, guys. Great. How are you guys doing? How is your brew going? Yeah, we're just coming to the end of the boil. We're just, uh, if you just stick with us, we're just about to add the uh, the lake hop into the boil just down now. So I'll let Simon man the camera and I'll do the thing. Uh, okay. Awesome. So a bit of live, um, would you call it late hopping, Bill? Am I right to say live late hopping? Late hopping? Yep. Well, yes. There they go. Here's to all the hops. I know I love them. Well, which ones are they tossing? What are the hops that you guys are tossing in, Simon? Bill and Papa Pinion. Yeah, top of finance went in there as well. And um, they've just asked. Uh, sorry, just asking what the top of finance is. Yeah, sorry, the, the copper filings just basically help settle out the protein that's in the, in the um, that we boil out during the boil. Um, a lot of the protein. Um, comes out solution, so the copper fine just helps settle that protein out as we move through into the whirlpool section. So, um, so without it, we get a big carryover of that protein into the final beer, and then that would give us problems with hazy beer or any hard to filter or etc. So, it's really one of the first steps of clarifying the beer and getting a nice, uh, nice dry beer in the in the, um, in the glass at the end of the day, really. So, we've got to get rid of protein. We want some protein, we want protein that's going to give us head on the beer, and protein that's going to give us head on the beer, and protein that's going to give us head on the beer. We've had a great day here, and what we'll probably do is we'll, we're going to carry on cleaning and just carry on with the brewing process, but then just to reiterate, Bill's going to go home, I'm going to go back to my home, but we're going to rejoin the hangout later on. 
Awesome. That's fantastic. Um, we are so happy you guys were able to participate. And I know that everyone from Craft Beer Nation who makes their way over to the UK will be visiting Brains Craft Brewery and looking for their beers in the pub. So thank you so much for participating in the Big Sip Out. We are so happy you guys did. Brilliant. Now it's a pleasure. Phil just offered me to go down to the cellar. He's got some very special beer down there which we're going to go and taste now. Exclusive stuff. Um, we'll leave the camera on the brewery, but yeah, we're going to head off and uh, go try some salad beer. Awesome. Thank you so, so much. Cheers. Hey, uh, let's, let's, let's kick back over to Santa Fe real Cheers. quick. Cheers. Uh, I know you can hardly contain yourself. I know. Market. They have distro news for us, and I've been trying Woo. to get to where I am for like the last, I would say, two months. So, hey, Boris... Boris, Boris, let's go back over to you. We have the owner of Santa Fe Brewing sitting with Boris. They look like they're deep in conversation right now, too. I don't know if you can see them. Boris! I don't think you can hear Sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> hey, thanks thanks so much, uh, Brains and, uh, and uh, Masters. Um, but Brian, the owner of Santa Fe, has uh, races with his presence. So uh, how's it going, guys? What's up, bro? How Mark, are you? Marcus and Tara, I hope you're drinking a beer. Are you drinking a beer, Tara? Oh, absolutely, oh, I am right here. Excellent, okay. Just making sure. <laughs> we are so excited that you guys decided to participate today. I, well, I'm, I'm so excited that uh, we're a part of something so huge across the entire world. You know, that's so cool. It is fun. We're pretty pleased with how this has come out so far. It's really neat to see all these brew houses working at the same time, making the same beer. So that's great. We heard you had news for us, and I know that Marcus is at the seat of his pants right now and cannot handle it much longer. Do you have news? Well, yes. Um, <laughs> I actually spoke with um, a woman over at Missouri Beverage that uh, – wants to distribute our brand statewide in Missouri. So, <laughs> Yay. so, uh, so we're looking at potentially trying to shoot for like a November uh, launch, you know, towards the end of this year, launch in the rest of Missouri. That's so exciting. Congratulations. Dude, that is so awesome. So you're going to come up and like do a giant party here, right? Well, as long as you're going to host me, for sure. Dude, bro, I've got room. You're welcome here. Awesome. Okay. I'll bring the beer. You you provide the uh, bed, and I'll bring the beer. <laughs> that sounds like a sweet deal. Sounds like quite a deal. Very exciting. So do you guys have any other distribution news coming up? Or are you guys going to be spreading to even more states? Are you still kind of trying to grow a little slow and organic and... Uh, it seems like that's what done so far. Yeah, we, no, certainly we're going to continue to focus on, you know, growing from the roots out. And so uh, we just opened up Nevada uh, as our eighth state overall. Um, we launched there in, uh, in June, and so far it's been going really well. Um, and then one of the other things, I don't know if Marcus uh, or Max mentioned, but we came out with our 25th anniversary uh, celebration. Um, in a can, kind of tribute beer, which is Saison, um, called Saison 88, and Marcus just tried it, actually, so he was telling me about, or Bart, Boris just told me about uh, how he was drinking it um, this morning already, so I'll let him give you some feedback. Yeah, uh, uh, they use, uh, they dry hop it, one, with three different hops, one of them is the Saison, that German... Yeah, a, a Saison is dry hop? Yes, yes, it's... Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, dry hop uh, with, uh, if I remember correctly, Chinook, Saz, and Simcoe. And, man. And then it's bittered. Oh, uh, this is Yeah, it's bittered mostly with Saz hops. And, man, oh, my God, it's so good. It's so good. That's, yeah, it's, it's not like, don't think of a, like a, uh, like a hoppy Saison. It's, it's that. It's right up to the max of balance. If, if they would have added like a quarter of an ounce more, it would have been like too hoppy. So it's right to that max. For the Saison style, 
Chris is 5.5%. Nice and golden, nice frothy white head. And it's just like that nice, bitter, and it still has the Saison quality, that like peppery, like pepper, right? yeah, that peppery yeast that you get out of it. So, oh man, it's, oh my God, it's so good. I'm at least taking a six pack home, if not a 12 pack. And then uh, I will spread the love like I've, I've been trying to do with most of the Santa Fe beers that I got. Hello, my name is Jealous. <laughs> hey, don't, hey, Randy, don't worry. You'll get your, you'll get your box Monday or Tuesday with, uh, with that, with that chicken in it. <laughs> you know, we've heard that uh, phrase before: the beer is in the mail. So, just like, just like the beer glasses. Kind of like the gla Oh yeah, the glassware. We'll, we'll send you that glassware. Hint, hint. <laughs> I, I really hope Lee is watching because he's just getting stomped all day. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, actually, actually, that was in, that was actually that was kind of hinted towards another brewery that will not be named. <laughs> oh, thanks. Nice. Oh, don't go there. <laughs> you know, that's live public that's, recording. Yeah, Max is gonna go grab their uh their anniversary glass, uh, the 25th year, 25 year anniversary. They have two, they have three glasses that they sell here. You have your traditional shaker pint. Then they have uh, that elongated tulip that, that I bought when I was here a couple months ago. And then they have their 25th anniversary glass, which is that right there. Yeah. Oh, it's a beautiful one. Man, that is gorgeous. Hey, yeah. Yeah. We've been talking about it right quick and tell uh, Brian who we're talking about. <laughs> so if you look at the rim, I don't know if you can see it, it's platinum on the rim because this is our silver anniversary. So we threw the silver lining on the rim of the glass. So <laughs> yeah, like that gold stuff. <laughs> nice. Boris, if I don't get a glass like that, there will be no Air Force place that you're going to be able to buy from me. No, no, Boris, make sure Gil gets a shaker pint. I think that Gil does need more shaker pints in his life. There, there, there's one, one like this. Oh, that is nice. Gil, the moment I saw their 25th anniversary, I was like, I am so getting that for myself and not Gil. Hey, is that glass available online to buy if you wanted? Uh, it depends. Who's buying it? Are you buying it, Marcus? <laughs> I would. I would. All Me right. Too. For you, it's available. <laughs> Randy, I'm, I'm, this verdict's still out for you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Does this help? Look. Better. Okay, now you can have one. <laughs> Oh, you guys are too much. You and your glasswares <laughs> and your babies. Everyone has glassware and babies. Beer, blown glass, and babies. Yes. <laughs> this is the third baby to make an appearance today. It's kind of cute, I have to say. Oh, but thanks, uh, do we have any? I'm not. I mean, it's cute that there's babies on here. But yes, your baby itself is absolutely <laughs> cute. Not kind of cute. <laughs> uh, back to Santa Fe Brewing. Do we have any other news from you guys? I know that uh, we have your Oktoberfest to look forward to, which I hope that Boris will send my way because I can't find your beer in Pennsylvania. Um, is there anything else new coming from you guys uh, in the next few months? Next uh, release in our Los Inhibidores series, which is our barrel aged beer series. Um, and I don't know if, if Max uh, or Boris yeah. have showed you guys, but we released a creek oh, um, one, yes. about a month ago, and it's pretty much sold out already. It's gone. But uh, we have a single barrel sour, um, which is an unblended barrel aged sour that's going to release probably mid September, and that's called single barrel sour. I'm going to go broke this fall. <laughs> Napkins. <laughs> Napkins, towels, and a Shower. <laughs> really? Really? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've been drinking since like 9 a.m. No excuses today. 
But yeah. Uh, Anyhow. <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's a baby in the room, Boris. They're, uh, well, right now they're gonna, Max is gonna go grab the creep bottle that, uh, Brian just mentioned. Uh -oh. Well, they're gonna use like, us. Just to make you salivate a little bit, we'll show you what the bottle looks like. Ah. Uh, you guys have already not fair. Like, I've, I've already had it, shared it, loved it, tweeted it. I got one signed by Ty. Nice. And I visited two months ago. We hand stamp every, uh, let's see if I can get it on the camera. We hand stamp the barrel aged in oak on every label by hand. hand label them um, them. There's the little red stamp, and then hand sign them. You see the bottom. We sign them with uh, our, one of our guys, the brewery that was Gonzo, that did this bottle. And then uh, we put the year on the, on the strip on the flip top ceramic. That is a gorgeous bottle. Like that's that's one that you would that you would keep to reuse as like a growler or something. It is a very good bottle. That was kind of part of the uh, part of the idea is that we wanted to bring something out that was uh, something that the home brewers could be like, man, I'm gonna buy that bottle just because I can use it again and again. Yeah, I wanna. I I've already shared it with the community when I first had it a couple months back, but that it's really hard to see it via webcam. But right behind the word creek, that's embossed. With the New Mexican seal and the bottle cap that Santa Fe uses as her label, it's you can kind of see it right there, and that's on every single label that is hand labeled. Awesome, awesome. I have some serious beer envy right now. I'm again, I'm so jealous of all the people who are at breweries today. It's just not fair. <laughs> So but, do we have any more questions? When you buy one of those bottles, you have like a lifetime refilling kind of thing. You just bring the bottle. <laughs> the brewery. Yeah. 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 Say that again. You, uh, the background got in. So when you buy one of those bottles, you have a lifetime refilling. You just bring the bottle back to the brewery and get refilled. Is that what it is? <laughs> I might. I might. <laughs> I don't know if that's gonna work. <laughs> hey, so there was a there was a question on the event page. I think it may have been more homebrew focused, but I think it's a good question to ask the commercial guys as well. And there was a question about keeping fermenters in the correct temperature range. So in the Santa Fe brewery, how do you keep all your fermentators uh, in the correct range? Is it like a? I know some folks have like a like a liquid gel glycol whatever it's called like inner wall is that what you use as well uh, yeah no we use that uh, uh, through our big system yeah we're like all chilled on all the jackets but interesting that you brought that up because literally today for our small batch system which we're brewing the, the IPA on which is you know the, the 31 gallon size batch so traditionally we've been fermenting back in our finished product storage which in the summertime can get up to like 70 75 um, in the winter time, it can be as cold as like 40 or 45. So um, literally today, we just got dropped off a new uh, refrigeration unit on wheels. That we're gonna now ferment all of our small batch into, um, which is actually out right right over here. Just got delivered. There it is. Very cool. It looks so like Santa Fe out there. there. Yeah. <laughs> Sunny day. Of course. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Marcus, did you find any more questions on our event page or our Twitter feed or anywhere? Uh, I think that was the only one on the event. I am not down close enough to mention Twitter. Twitter. Let me log in. Well, we just want to thank all of you guys for you know giving us the time here. It's pretty awesome. Boris had to step out just for a quick second, but if you guys haven't already figured out, uh, we're pretty much about ready to offer him a job here. It's uh, it's pretty fun working with him, and uh, it's great that he can brew on our small batch system. I know it's not going to be his last time on this system, so uh, yeah, really if it wasn't for him contacting us a few months back, uh, we, you know, we wouldn't be a part of it, so it's a pretty great thing.
That's awesome. We're so excited to have you guys, and we know that Boris is probably one of your biggest fans, and in general, one of the biggest fans of craft beer that there is. So mm -hmm. we're really excited that he guys set you guys up with the Craft Beer Nation community, and we'd love to see you guys around for maybe some special releases or something. Keep us updated with what's going on in your brewery because we're all big fans of it now too. He sent us your beer. So most of the moderators have had it at this point, even if they live over on the East Coast like I do. Um, so we are big fans of your beer. What's that? I said undoubtedly the pleasure is ours. <laughs> just type it, bro. Just, just type it. Type it. <laughs> so I think what we were supposed to have at this time was a little music break. Hey, you guys. Um, sorry, sorry to cut in real quick, but Brian's got to take off. He's he's a busy man. See you guys. Hey, Thanks you for your time. Guys. You guys are on. Awesome. Cheers. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. You guys hang. Do you guys hang after work as well? You guys always like. It seems very, very close. Last time I remember from the spotlight, you guys have seems to have a lot of fun together. Yeah. Are hey, you Gil. Um, I know that we were supposed to have a little music intermission right now. I am yeah, we'll, we'll have it soon. Uh, we'll be a little delayed for the intermission, so. Uh, uh, he, he's getting ready, so... Okay, that's awesome. Are we going to have Miss Nicole joining us now or after the break? Uh, that'll go after the break. Yeah, she's just going to be a little later. Yeah. So, um, I want to give a little shout-out to one of my buddies that just told me he's watching. So, what's up, Jeff? And uh, he had a he had a smart-ass remark about my hair. And there is a story to, to my hair. Uh, so last night was company pool party, and I showed up late, and my hair was all crazy like this after getting out of the pool. And uh, Lee Allison pretty much dared me to show up today like this. So I took my shower this morning, and I didn't do anything with my hair. I just let it do its thing. So, Lee, I did it. You owe me. You can send beer. Well, I hope you go into the barbershop as soon as the sip is over, man. <laughs> you know, I'm kind of, I'm kind of digging this actually. It looks like you just enjoy running your fingers through your We're hair not digging it. over and over and over again. You're digging it, but we're not. You know what? Yeah. I'm not here to impress you, bro. New t-shirts, mother truckers. What? Pike Lake what? Brewing Company. And what is Pike Lake Brewing Company, Michael? Please tell that us. That is actually going to be, that is my startup venture. Uh, like they're home brewers with aspirations of going commercial. This mother trucker is planning on going commercial. That would be Mother Giffer. Mother Giffer to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm trying to be PG here, you know. Oh. So right. hey, there was a question about uh, fermenters and keeping them at the proper temperature. We already heard about Santa Fe's little, their little setup, so let's hear about a home brew. How, yes. how, what, what are some tips on keeping beers in the correct range while they're in the ferment process? Yeah, in the ferment All right, good. that's actually a really so, good question. Um, if, uh, most, most home brewers will tend to ferment in the basement where it's cooler. Um, if you can, most ales will be fine if you can ferment in the mid-60s. Um, but if you need warmer temperatures and you're using glass carboys, you can get what's called a firm wrap. It's basically like plastic sheeting that has electrical wires running through it, and you plug it in. And you can plug it into a temperature controller, and you can dial in what temperature you want to raise your fermentation to. Or you can do what I do. I do a poor man's uh, uh, fermentation box where I've got... Under my stairwell, I took some insulation and built basically a, a chamber where I can stick my carboys in, and I use um, apple juice jugs, plastic apple juice jugs that I filled like two thirds with water, freeze them, and then I put uh, like four jugs, uh, frozen jugs will bring that ambient temperature down to lager temperatures around 55 degrees. 
Uh, so it's so I can do you know all the classic German loggers, pilsners, and whatnot, um, and then you know it works great. How long and then there's no the electricity involved. Down? But uh, fermentation temperature is really huge um, for you know uh, cranking out a really good tasting beer. With some strains, if you ferment too high, you get fruity esters, and in some beers, that's not necessarily appropriate. Um, oh. Speaking of kids, say hi, Christopher. What's say up, hi. dude? Hi. <laughs> Hello. Um, and then, you know, lower fermentation temperatures, you get some of the more refined characteristics from the yeast. So. Yep. That was a fantastic answer. Thank you, Michael. You're welcome. Michael, how long does that apple juice jug method keep your ambient temperature down? Do you have to keep refreezing the jugs or Yep. So like so like if I'm doing a lager uh, and fermenting at lagering temperatures, like mid fifties, I'll usually swap out the jugs every day. Um, there's usually still like residual ice left in the jugs, but you swap them out and you can maintain mid fifties pretty easily okay. with uh, four to five jugs. So and no again, no electricity involved, just some uh, the pink foam insulation and just a nice nice big box that can fit the fermentation vessel. I think it's and you going can, green. I'm going green man. Off the grid. Off the grid. Off the charts, man. I'm off the hook. <laughs> All right, well, I'll turn it back to you guys. Okay, so Matthew, do you have any updates for us for the latter half of this big sip of hangout? I do. We're actually right now uh, trying to uh, work out something that we've got a little problem with. So we might actually flip uh, two of the guests where we might uh, uh, do some working stuff. So talk amongst yourselves and uh, <laughs> while, I'm, while I'm frantically trying to get this set up. Okay. That sounds good. Well, Tara, I share the same jealousy as you with uh, being jealous of everyone else who's at a brewery. But it could be worse because Alan, Alan, like I said, he's on meds and can't drink. So at least we can drink. So he, he, he has a little bit worse. That is very true. I am enjoying a very tasty beer. So. What are you drinking? <laughs> Right now, I'm drinking Ellie's Brown Ale. Ah, by Avery. Yes. I think this is delicious. It's one of my favorites, I, I will just, have to say. I just polished off a undercover shutdown. You know, and, and to keep the brewery theme going, I had my first ever little something. Hold on, let me turn off this light so you can actually see the label. My first ever little something. I brought it back from North Carolina. I brought it back an entire six pack, and I'm very glad I went ahead and got an entire six of this because it is awesome. Yeah, they 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 get it right, man. Lagunitas. They do not make a bad beer at all. I, I agree with that. And they like they they're like hop masters, man. They they know how to like they have they have a a, a pronounced in and consistent malt backbone throughout all their beers, in my opinion. But I mean, to 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 balance that off, they do such a great job with their hops and and all their beers. I mean, even even Hop Stupid, which is stupidly hopped, is still is still done right, man. So yeah, they're, see, they're, they're really enjoy they're probably one one of my favorite breweries. I I can I think I can definitely say that. I had the choice of getting a couple of Hop Stupids or getting a six of Little Something. And I and I made the I made the decision to get a, a an entire six a little something. Do you think I made the right decision, or should I gone with a couple of big bottles of Hop Stupid? I mean, I I don't think that you you would have gone wrong either way. But you are had you gotten a Hop Stupid, I would have said, oh man, you're missing out on something by getting a little something. And now that you got a little something, I'm gonna say, dude, you're certainly missing out on something by not getting Hop Stupid. So <laughs> there's there's no winning apparently. It's no win. You know, and I've I, you know I I've, I've talked about this new local new local bottle shop um, a couple of times, and 
I told him that there are so many of these of these Lagunitas beers that we don't get in Missouri for whatever reason, or the distributor just decides not to get from the brewery, or what. And I was like, dude, we need these beers. And uh, he says he's going to look into it for me and let me know uh, why we're not getting like the full spread of of these beers. Because there's no excuse. There's really not. Because I mean, I have absolutely never seen this in any store anywhere near me. You know, this this little something. And this lady is this this little pinup here is a nice touch, um, you know. And there's just no reason not to get the full spread. So hopefully, hopefully in the next few months we can figure out uh, why my little my little corner of or middle of Missouri isn't getting the full spread of Lagunitas. Yeah, Marcus. Since I got a long list of things to send out, I might as well. Add you to the list and see if I can see if I can get you some hop stupid man. <laughs> All right, I'll take that, dude. I will take that. Alrighty, so um, well, our schedule's gotten kind of disrupted. We're we're about eight minutes from our hard break. Uh, the limit that Google has in place on how long a hanging on air can actually last. Uh, do we wanna do we wanna go ahead and take that break now? That's not actually true. Uh, we have a it's a four hour limit, so we can go until two o'clock. If we break too early, we won't make it all the way till five. So let's just go ahead and uh, I'll let you know when the break is. Okay, that works. That works. Alrighty. So um, well, with with uh, our schedule kind of out of whack, that's kind of left a wide open spot here. So uh, since I missed the hangout last night and didn't get a chance to hear what everyone had to drink. Uh, what did, what did y'all drink and what did you think of it? Actually, let's uh, let's stay with the sip. But let's go to Michael again. And Michael, tell us where you're at in the process. Um, we're hold on, Lily. Uh, we're kind of midway through. Well, almost midway through the boil. We've got actually both James and I are doing a 90 minute boil instead of the 60 minute boil to get a little bit more of the. Um, Mayard reaction, a little bit more of the caramelization. So we're we still about 60 minutes left in the boil, and then we'll be adding some hops in about 30 minutes here. And and then for, for wheat, I made one minor addition. There's like the the standard recipe has the Columbus at the 60 minute mark, but what we did is we bumped everything back. So we got 90 minutes. I threw in a hop shot, and then I bumped that Columbus down from 60 to 30 minutes, so we get a little bit more of the flavor compounds from the Columbus hop. Since we're getting all the bitterness at the in the hop shot at the ninety minutes, you've done a pretty drastic change on this recipe. Well, well, I mean, if you look at all the things, you're, you're doing a hop shot. You're you didn't you change out your malt? The no, the malt is pretty much the same. It's just a different kind. We're we're using I'm Jameson's using just domestic two row uh, pale malt, and I'm um, using English pale two row malt. So, so what's the difference between what you're using and what the recipe called for? Like what the, what will the, it have like the, what will it be the effect on the final flavor? It'll be really subtle. Um, there might be a little bit more of a biscuity quality from the English. Um, plus I'm using the British ale yeast, um, which is a little bit different than ten fifty six. Ten fifty six pretty much is a workhorse, but will get out of the way in terms of flavor. The, the British ale yeast will have kind of that unique um, uh, quality about it that's a little bit different from the standard American ale counterpart. So, but it's when we when I mean to me the recipe when we first saw it was kind of up in the air. So I thought, eh. you know, we weren't really at the time we weren't really specifying which types of hail malt to use. Were we going to use English, German, you know, in, American? So that's I think that's going to be kind of the, the fun part about it when it comes to tasting. And I'll try and actually, if I can get around to it, send, send some bombers to a couple of you um, so you can actually compare the difference. We'll probably have a tasting here as well on that Saturday when we do the big sip of tasting in August. So I'm looking forward to it. Delicious. All right. Um, what we've got is we have a four-hour hard limit from Google um, with a hangout on air. So we knew at some point today we were going to have to break this down. 
new one and start broadcasting again. So if you're tuned in and watching, all you've got to do is give us about five minutes and go back to the event page or go back to the place that you got this video stream from and you'll see the big step up part two and that will be the live feed for the second half of the show. So we should be gone for about five minutes while we tear this down, get it set back up and get people invited and uh, we'll be back on the air for the remainder of the show. We're going to have our master Cicerone on. She's going to be next as soon as, uh, as, soon as we get down here. So uh, we'll see you in five minutes.